You can get access to each episode's transcript with key learning points, timestamps, and references if you get yourself onto my mailing list. Just go to the main website on policesciencedoctor.com and on the bottom of each page you will find a sign-up form for notifications of new content. Just enter your first name, your preferred email address and the type of organization you work for. You will not get any spam. This is just for me to let you know about new content and for you to get access to all the transcripts. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? Just a quick test because I changed over the microphone. Anya, can you tell me if you can hear me? I've got my lovely friend Anya helping me as a backstage assistant today. So this is not a great start to have to test the microphone, but let me just check if that's all working. Yeah, okay, good. So, oh, thank you. Thank you guys. You're responding in the comments. Fantastic. Oh, so let me do this properly and much more professionally. Okay. Welcome to the very first rapid fire conference on behavioral science in policing. I'm really excited to have you there. A lot of you have already tuned in. I've been working and preparing this conference for ages now, and I know a lot of you are really excited to be joining in as well. And I'm so glad that you are coming. I'm so glad in advance all the support you've been sending about you wanting to be here and wanting to see all the content, but I'm not going to be wasting your time. You know me, I get straight to the point. So let me just, after this welcome, um, I had Bana in here earlier and we're going to show that in again. So if you register for the conference, you can get a certificate of attendance afterwards. So if you haven't actually registered yet, that's not a problem, you can still do so. We're going to show you the, um, the link now. It's going to be posted into the comments as well. So you can get a certificate of attendance to show that you've done a professional, you know, a professional development event. And you will also get email. So the registering for the conference would add you to the email, police science doctor email list. And after the conference, if you're on the email list, you will get linked, uh, you will get sent a link to the ebook, but a discounted link. So what I've done, um, because I know that sometimes you're sitting at a conference and you're watching the content and you're trying to take it in and you're trying to remember what's being said. Maybe you're taking some notes and whilst you're writing, you know, the speaker has moved on and you're missing, 
you know, you're missing out on a lot of information and then you go away and you forget, you know, you only retain 10% of classroom training. I don't want you to only retain 10% of what you're going to see here. There's fantastic nine training sessions for you. I want you to take, uh, you know, with you as much as possible. So what I've done, I've transcribed all the sessions. So one thing to explain, these, uh, these trainers are not going to be here live, okay? I want to improve the user experience. I don't want to have any technical glitches in here. And I want to make sure you get the best, best possible user experience. So these, um, the training sessions were actually sent to me in advance. They've recorded them for me, specifically for this conference in advance and sent them to me. I transcribed these training sessions and I put them together in an ebook. So basically what you can do, you can get that ebook and you've got everything that was set in that training session. You also have all the references, all the links to any resources that were quoted that I mentioned in the sessions, and you have the contact details of the people who are actually delivering the training sessions. So if you're interest, interested in that ebook, you can, um, as I said, you get it as a discounted rate of 9.99, and that's dollars. If you're on the email list, and that's the um, forward slash RFC link, polysciencedoctor.rfc, you can subscribe there, you get the email link with a discount email to you. Or if you don't want to join the list, um, and you're not, you don't need a certificate of attendance, we're going to show you um, a in the comments here as well, where you can get the ebook for the full price. It's eleven ninety nine. You know, it's still not uh, it's still not a deal breaker, really. So, but that we were going to be telling you that throughout the conference because um, I think if you get value from this and you want to take that with you and you want to retain the value, you want to look up something in the in the future that you will you will definitely forget some of the content in here. Um, you know, that's just how our brains work. Right, so very quickly, um, who am I? Um, I'm Suzanne Knabe-Nicole, I'm an investigative psychologist. Um, I've got a master's and a PhD in investigative psychology. I did my PhD thesis on behavioral analysis in major crime investigations. And um, I've been working, uh, I've worked in UK policing in, in a number of forces and a number of civilian jobs for um, over 10 years. And um, I started something called Police Science Doctor. Now, there were two previous iterations to Police Science Doctor. The first one was Dr. IPIP and then EBP Doctor. But basically, the, the content I produce as Police Science Doctor, and it's going to remain Police Science Doctor, I'm pretty sure, is I take academic research that is relevant to you, law enforcement practitioners, police, sheriffs, you know, whatever you are, researchers and students in the field, criminology, police science, um, investigative psychology, forensic psychology, you know, even some of this other social um, social subjects are going to be covered. I take research from that. That's not usually available to the practitioner because you can you don't even have access to academic journals. And I take that research and I translate it in something you can actually use. I turn it into videos, into a podcast, transcripts, and every week I also send out um, three golden nuggets nuggets from research. So that's three police science snippets that I email out to the email list every Tuesday. So um, that's another perk of being on the email list. Just go to the main policesciencedoctor.com website. You can subscribe there. It's free. It's a free service. You know, these videos are free. Um, and the um, police science snippet email is free as well. So I've explained what police science doctor is. Why did I set up this conference? Um, there are a lot and a lot and a lot of topics in behavioral science, in policing, in research that are being researched and grown that the law enforcement practitioner is not aware of. And there's a lot of behavioral science that can be brought into policing. And I'm not just talking about, you know, you don't have to be, you know, if you know my website, you don't have to be a psychologist graduate to un understand what I'm doing. It's really for the practitioner, the, per the person on the ground, the people interacting with the public every day, wearing uniforms, working in offices, in police agencies. So it's really for the practitioner. And there's a lot of material and a lot of knowledge that you guys has not just has just not been communicated to you guys. And this conference is one attempt of um of by me in doing that, basically. So there is an intro to a range of topics within behavioral science that can enhance policing. Um, there's so much out there that most of the law enforcement officers just don't know about. And I want you to, th these are not going to be you know, certificate courses you're going to get today. They're training sessions, 10 minute training sessions, just to get you a glimpse of a specific area. And if you're then interested in one of the areas, you can then look further into you know, finding out more about it. Um, there's going to be lots of resources in there. So um, links to the articles, links to books on uh, by some of the speakers that may be relevant to you. So if something is, is you know, if a particular topic, a, a particular video really piqued your interest, you know, go ahead and look a little bit further um, and, you know, just educate yourself further. We're always learning. And, you know, Police Science Doctor is about educating law enforcement. It's about bringing science, police science into police. Um, 
And yeah, to ensure the best user experience, as I said, these are pre-recorded videos that I'm going to play, but they were specifically recorded, created for this conference. And I asked, asked the speakers to keep it brief. And believe you me, it was not easy for them. Some of them had to record it twice. And um, I did some editing as well. And um, yeah, and the so if you want to take something home with you, it's um, the ebook that um, you can you can get um, either during the conference if you want to pay full price, or if you're if you if you're a subscriber, you'll get the link afterwards. You can become a subscriber throughout the conference and get that discount. Right. Okay. So um, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, um, I know there's lots of comments coming in. I'm not concentrating on them. That's why I've asked my amazing friend Anya to help me with them. But the comments, you know, are at the moment for you. Introduce yourself, where you're coming from, just so everyone knows, you know, this is a global event. But if you want to ask a question, I'll do my best to answer these questions in between sessions. But please mark, start it with a Q. So if you've got the, the letter Q at the beginning of a question, it'll be easier for Anya to see that, and then she can select it and display it for me on the screen, and I can, I can try to answer it. Bear in mind, these training sessions are by nine different experts. You know, they're talking about something that they've done a lot of research and a lot of work in, but I am familiar with the topics. I'll do my best to answer these questions. If I can't answer them, um, I'll try not to waffle around it. I'll try to tell you that I can't answer them and, you know, apologies, but um, maybe we can get an answer for you some other way. So please do put answers, uh, please do put questions in there, but start them with a cue so it's very clear to see um, which of the comments are actually questions. Now, the structure of the, um, the structure of the conference today is that I'm going to introduce the speaker, introduce the session that's coming and um, who's delivering the session. Then I'm going to play you the session and then I'm going to do a bit of a discuss discussion about what we've just heard. I think that's very valuable because um, it's, it, it helps embed the information in your brain. It helps put it into context and it just it deepens the learning experience. And um, and then we're, going, we're moving on to the next session. Okay, so we've got nine such sessions lined up. I'm guessing it might take about two hours, um, but we'll see. It's life, you know, you never know. So first of all, I wanted to say a big thank you to Policing Insight magazine. So policinginsight.com is, um, is our media partner for this event. They've been really supportive and getting the word out. And, you know, maybe some of you have come to this conference because they've, they've seen um, this advertised in their magazine or on their website. And so there's, they're a great source of information. They've got articles, they've got news um, that are relevant to policing, and they've got a whole research section. So they're looking at academic articles as well and making them accessible. So definitely check them out. It's policinginsight.com. I'm really, really grateful for their support. So fantastic media partners, Policing Insight, worth checking out. There's going to be quite a few links that we're actually putting into the comments for you. So what you could do if you wanted, start a Word document or a Google Doc or whatever using a notepad and just copy some of those links out for later reference. I actually don't want you to leave the conference to look at other websites, but I do want you to be able to have access to these resources because they're relevant resources. I wouldn't have put them in there if they weren't of value to you. So maybe start a document, just collate those um, um, links in, in that document and please go and check them out later after the conference, you know, your main focus is here now. Um, and um, just an advanced thing. Um, so this is my very first live event. I'm actually doing another one in three weeks. It's a webinar and it's on mental health and policing. And you wouldn't believe when I started doing research for that webinar, it, it almost sidetracked me from preparing for this one because I got so busy. I got so many responses for my initial inquiries. So it's about, we're going to talk about the global perspectives of, um, what it is like for policing in terms of mental health support and luck thereof in most cases. Um, but it's not going to be a webinar where I'm pulling all those people together to complain. I'm also going to share best practices. You know, some somebody in America is doing this and that works really well. I want everyone else to hear about it. Someone in New Zealand might be doing this, someone in Sweden is doing this and is sharing tools and ideas and things that are already working that I want you to come away with and then go and speak to someone at work to see if you can implement it, if you can try it. OK, so there's um, there's a link. You can already sign up for the webinar. It's a free webinar, um, Mental Health and Policing, and the link is hopefully um, going to be posted in the comments right now. Yes, it is. OK, again, put that on your notepad, copy it out. And then one of the tools to combat um, bad mental health and mental ill health in policing is actually the upcoming course that um, is going to be launched in the Police Science Doctor Academy in May. It's the full, first full, full feature length course. It's called Emergency Stress Pit Stop. 
It deals with stress and policing. It helps you to deal with stress and policing. It's going to be by one of the speakers actually at this conference. So you're going, you're going to hear from her soon. That's Jenny McKenna. You can already sign up for, um, you know, pre-register for the course, basically. Um, you've got the link in the comments there as well. Again, put that onto your, copy that onto your document. Now to the first session. So there's only 12 minutes in. So um, I hope everything I've said so far is relatively valuable. I, like I said, I don't, didn't want to, to waffle and I really respect your time. So the first session is by Dr. Patrick Tidmarsh. Patrick is an amazing guy. He's a Brit, but he's emigrated to Australia and he's he's been there for quite a few years. And you will notice, well, I notice a bit of an Australian twang in his um, British accent. Um, Patrick is a criminologist and he specializes in inter investigating sexual offenses. He has extensive experience of working with sex offenders directly and with the police directly. He's um, he's developed a methodology where on where to find evidence when investigating sexual offenses, because most of these offenses happen in private, happen behind closed doors. And what kind of ev evidence can you, you know, present? You know, if there's forensic DNA evidence, anything like that, that's usually explained away by the offender as consensual. It's very difficult to prove, but he's found a way of how you can prove it, how you can find the evidence and where you can find the evidence in sexual offense cases. So, um, in most cases, there is no external evidence, something like CCTV or anything like that. So how do you convict someone? Well, you're about to find out. So I'm going to play you this session now. Um, here goes Patrick. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this rapid fire conference presentation. I'm going to talk about where the evidence is in sexual crime investigation. Essentially, my argument to you is that sexual offending and child sexual abuse are crimes of relationship, whether they happen over two minutes or 20 years, they're a crime of relationship. And rather than the story guiding us to where evidence might be, my argument is the story is the evidence. Most of this offending takes place in private without other external corroboration. So the story uh, and our ability through interviewing to gather that story is everything. Here are the topics I wanna to cover in brief over this next period of time. I want to talk about how we used to investigate it and how we now investigate it, certainly here in Victoria with the whole story methodology that we've developed. I wanna talk about counterintuitive or so-called counterintuitive victim behavior. I wanna talk about our, our social scripts, uh, myths and misconceptions, and how previously we have focused on victim behavior and why would she do that? Why uh, did he go around to the guy's house? Why did she stay with him? And that through whole story, we've tried to get our investigators to focus not on why would she do that, because we're still going to need to ask those questions, but how did he get her to do that? And then we're going to move on to grooming and understanding grooming in a bit more detail and evidence and where relevant evidence is. So before we get to that, I want to tell you two brief stories um, and then we'll come back to them um, at, at the end of the, the period. So here's the first one. A 22 year old young woman comes into a police station and says, I've been being sexually abused by my stepfather since I was 12. Um, we've just had a big argument because he wants his girlfriend to move in and he's kicking me out. And now I want to tell you everything that he's done to me. So what are our problems with um, looking at her behavior, judging her behavior, missing misconceptions, and most important of all, where's the evidence going to be in this particular case? Here's the second one. So a woman goes for a massage. She hasn't been to this particular place before. She usually goes somewhere else. And the first time she walks in uh, over a 45 minute massage, she um, takes off all her clothes for that massage. just lying on the bed after about 40 minutes. She is uh, digitally raped over a period of several minutes. She um, thanks the masseur for his service, pays on the way out, and although she tells her sister that a bad thing has happened, she doesn't go to the police for two weeks. What are our problems when this comes to a fact finder and where's the evidence? Okay, so we'll come back to those later. Let's talk in a little bit more detail about all those things I mentioned. Um, and starting with, how did we used to investigate sexual crime? So to put it crudely, the way we used to talk about it was what went where, how far did it go in? What act can you charge him with? Because we have to particularize this. And can anyone back up what she's saying? And as the years roll by and the evidence becomes ever more irrefutable that the majority of this happens in private, that 
um, people are reluctant to come forward, only one in eight uh, adults, uh, mostly women, although men obviously do get raped as well, but um, their reporting rates are even less than, than women who are offended against. And although it's harder to determine with children, maybe one in 10 children re report during childhood, and our Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse here in Australia found that the average time um, people waited if they were abused to children to tell their report was over 20 years. So most people don't come forward and they don't come forward in part because of the way we as a community still understand sexual offending and sexual crime because of, for example, counter and so-called counterintuitive victim behavior. The more you understand sexual offending is a crime of manipulation and grooming and relationship, the more you understand that why people stay why so much of, uh, of what we know about offending it has been profoundly wrong, why injuries, for example, are much uh, less common, why DNA evidence uh, isn't as useful as one might think it would be, why there is so seldom external corroboration of what took place between those people. And so the shift needs to be not on judging victim behavior, and I haven't got time in 10 minutes to talk about our victim blaming culture or patriarchy or misogyny or any of the other structures in adversarial justice that are problematic, but assume that, you know, if we had longer, we'd get to those. Um, what we're talking about here really is where, when we do come to understand these stories, how can we better understand them? And how can we, as part of uh, the investigative stream and the prosecutorial stream, um, better uh, understand the story and present relevant evidence to, to a fact finder. So um, the breadth and depth of myths and misconceptions is huge. And whilst I have it, uh, we here produced uh, this document uh, for our prosecutors and investigators. You can find it if you go online to um, Victoria Police Myths and Misconceptions, you, you, you can find this document. And also myself and a couple of other colleagues have written for uh, the Australian Institute of Criminology's Trends and Issues series on myths and misconceptions in adult sexual crime, and they're both free resources. Uh, feel free to get them online. And the reason they're important is because we as a community have uh, so many broad myths and misconceptions, and our police officers, our investigators come from the community, and so part of the training of them and understanding these crimes is to take them to those myths and misconceptions, see where they're from, and see by working through narrative after narrative why um, we can no longer uh, be subject to that, and, and, and then how better do you listen to victims. So the other thing we found when we first started working with investigators here back in 2007 is although they understood grooming, I think everybody's heard that word now, most people see it as the kind of sexual end of grooming. And actually in terms of the gathering of relevant evidence and taking people's social scripts and presenting them with an alternative to that script that they can see, although I wouldn't, I don't think I would have done that, I understand why that person did that, or I understand why that person in those circumstances behaved the way they did, that <clears throat> understanding uh, grooming and um, what's in the literature is the qualitative elements of the narrative. Mostly grooming is what's going to explain that. So why that person did or didn't do what they did or didn't do. So we split it up into what we call grooming one and grooming two. So grooming one is power and control and authority. And, and that can take, I mean, well, in some cases it's, it's violence and there is no um, communication whatsoever aside from that violence. But far more often than not, in 90 five percent plus of cases you see significant grooming over minutes or hours or days or months or years uh, and and my biggest argument to you is that most of the relevant evidence that will persuade people of what took place in private is actually in the grooming one element of uh, the investigation. Um, it becomes more obvious when you come to grooming two. And so what will happen is you'll see uh, the power and control and authority element. Then the grooming two will come in and the grooming one will keep running. And then uh, the first offense uh, will happen. And so that offense is also a part of that secret and they kind of act uh, in in um, in co you know in a cohesive form to to keep uh, the person being victimized quiet minimize the chances of the offender being told on and in in many cases as offenders have told me many times during treatment sessions uh, to try and make that uh, victim feel responsible for what's taking place for them um, and also you'll see particularly in child sexual abuse cases you'll see grooming one continue way after uh, the offending has stopped and grooming two has stopped so gro grooming is far and away the most important thing for our investigators to understand so it, the story is the evidence and in that story the grooming is where most of the relevant evidence <coughs> is that they can gather 
So um, let's go back to those two stories. Let's look at that 22 year old young woman. Now, no surprise, most of what persuaded, uh, and in this case, uh, a jury found him guilty, most of what persuaded them of that guilt was the grooming one behavior, particularly from the time he entered, as a step parent, he entered their family at age six. And what we were able to do by drawing a complete narrative from her was to show how he had over time separated her from her siblings and her mother, uh, in part created conflict, how he had sided with her whenever she was in trouble with, with her parent. Um, so this special relationship formed, how when he sometimes uh, went away for periods of time, she would go with him uh, out of that, and how gradually he became the most important person in her life, isolated her from others, um, told her she was uh, they were soulmates but other people wouldn't understand etc etc and also she was then able to say that that uh, as a 22 23 year old she was still in a sexual relationship with him and that had continued right the way through even though he had been in other relationships uh, periodically through that time and as I don't have time for all the depth and breadth of evidence, uh, let me just say there were there was a remarkable level uh, of detail uh, about things he'd said, things he'd done, um, things about body image, things about touch that had changed and the way that he had gradually become the most important person in her life uh, and the only person in a way that she could rely on, even though that reliance was, was a lie and a distortion to, to feel safe out there, out there in the world. So uh, in some ways, even with historical cases and child sexual abuse cases, there's usually lots of depth and breadth in the narrative because there's usually lots of grooming, particularly grooming one. So let's talk about the massage story where it's only an hour uh, period that they're in, in contact with each other. What's he doing then? So she was able to detail how she had been for massages on multiple occasions, never been asked to take her underwear off before, and that he came up with a plausible excuse. Doesn't leave the room when uh, he says time to undress, but turns around and, and looks away. Uh, and she can talk about how she didn't want to make a fuss. She thought, well, you know, maybe he's not interested in, you know, maybe it's just what he does. Maybe it was too awkward to say, I'm sorry, but you need to leave. Um, even when he turns around to, to ask her a question in the middle of her undressing, he doesn't look her up and down, he looks her in the, in the eye. So she pushes her thought away about, well, that's, that's not right. And so you see, as happens in most cases, that grooming is done, uh, and clearly this wasn't the first time that he'd done it, that grooming is done in such a way that it's hard for people to, to challenge it, and that they're more likely to find a plausible explanation for that grooming. And again, to cut a relatively long story short, what he was able to do over a 40 minute period is, is take her from um, the authority she had when she came in the room to a vulnerability of uh, naked uh, in a place she'd never been before to a man who had behaved oddly uh, and unpredictably, but was very good at his job, at least for the first part of the massage. Um, and so by the time the <coughs> offending took place, um, as is so often the case here, uh, there was shock, uh, there was trauma, and that uh, produced um, uh, the freeze response or, or tonic immobility in, to um, look at its scientific terminology. So she froze on the table, uh, was unable, and she said she was, she was screaming in her head, but she didn't even know if she was screaming out loud because of that freeze reaction, which was yeah, a relatively, I mean, it was shocking, but it's a relatively common theme that comes up when, when uh, women talk about these particular stories and so when he said at the end how was that she felt compelled to say that was fine thank you and so back to his distorted thinking he can say oh, yeah, yeah, another one you know who, who wanted I knew what she wanted she paid on the way out because she didn't want to make a fuss and she didn't know who else was in on this or understood this about this man and when her sister suggested to her that she go to the police she thought oh my god what are they going to think of me and my behavior and so she says I'll just put it behind me and it isn't until she can't eat, she can't sleep. Uh, and then she drives into work one day and although she loves her job, she couldn't get out of a car that she says, right, that's it. And I'm going to the police. And so my argument is we have an expert in the room. We don't need an expert witness really to tell us what took place here. That if we <coughs> gather the narrative completely, 
the expert is there to tell us, well, why did you do or not do what you did or didn't do in that moment? Why wait two weeks? Why not challenge him in that moment? And we can have answers to that question because fact finders can understand what took place if we take them to the whole story of it. And we take them to that person's experience in that moment and provide them with information about why they did or didn't do on that point. And particularly if we can make the offender audible and visible so that they can see the pressures being brought to bear upon them. So where's the relevant evidence in sexual crime cases? It's in the story and particularly it's in the building blocks of the grooming and manipulation uh, of that abuse. Thanks very much for listening. Right. So that was Dr. Patrick Titmarsh. Um, I hope you got a lot out of that. There was a question about um, that video, which I am able to answer. Um, so digitally raped, digitally raped, does this mean the massage was filmed or was she indecently assaulted or raped? Now, this is a very good question because the term digital rape is a little bit confusing if you're not familiar with it. So digital rape means the offender rapes the victim, not with his penis, but with one of the digits of his hand. So he was basically using one or more fingers. Um, I'm glad that was asked because um, a lot of people will have had the same question and it's not, it's not something that normal people use in their normal day to day talking. Um, the the overlays that came up with the key points in the videos, that's, I w that was me who put that in the video, so I did some editing and um, uh, I meant to, I, I noticed that there was a spelling mistake in there. Now, if anyone else noticed a spelling mistake and something that I put on the video, the first person to call it out, or, um, you know, to put it into the comments is going to get a shout out from me. So um, I raised my hands. That was my mistake. It was not Patrick's. I put a spelling mistake in there. If you know what it was, if you know which word it was, just put it in. Right. So my discussion, the notes that I took from this video so that you don't have to take notes and you can just concentrate on um, on watching. Sexual offending and child sexual abuse are crimes of relationship, not single events. The story or the history is the evidence. We need to learn all, all about it in interview. Sexual offending is a crime of manipulation, grooming and relationship. The need to shift from why did she or why didn't she to how did he get her to do that? So the blame is on him, not on her. Often there is no independent or forensic evidence. Essential to understanding grooming, establishing power, control and authority, not necessarily sexual. So grooming is not necessarily sexual, okay? The main part is establishing the power and control over the victim. Grooming remains active to keep the victim quiet and make them feel responsible. Did you pick up on that? So in his sessions with sex, of sex offenders, Patrick was told many times that offenders deliberately try to make their victims whoever they are, even children, they deliberately try to make them feel responsible for the abuse. And grooming is where most of the evidence can be found. Right, so these are my notes from <clears throat> Patrick's session. So as I said, he's actually written a book about this. And um, this is the book, it's called The Whole Story. So if you're interested in what he's just told us about, then go and um, find this book. Now it's, um, the, the link is in the comments now, it's an affiliate link. What that means is it's absolutely fine. It's just an, a link that is um, traceable back to me. So this means you pay the normal price that you would pay if you, you know, if you bought the book on on a different, you know, on, on Amazon directly. You you found you searched it and you found it directly. And Patrick or the publisher gets the same price, but Amazon will give me a little bit of a um, percentage for putting you and um, Amazon together. Okay, so nobody's missing out except Amazon if you want to see it that way. But it's an affiliate link. I just need to make you aware of that. You can obviously use, you know, buy it anywhere you want. Right. Okay. The next session. So the next session is um, provided, taught by Alison Eaton. Um, Alison is a retired senior police officer and now a national and international trainer on gender-based violence. She also trains for Safe Lives, which is a charity um, who deliver the DA Matis training, domestic abuse. So DA is domestic abuse training to police around the UK. If you've ever worked on domestic cases, you will probably have noticed the anticlimax and frustration that comes with them when they seemingly go nowhere. So you want to help a victim, the victim doesn't accept the help. Um, you get frustrated with this DA incident and with future DA incidents because this is something that repeats over time when you work in DA. And that means you don't deliver your best policing possibly because you're not quite sure how to when the victim you're wanting to protect doesn't seem to want your help. 
You've probably wondered, why doesn't she leave? It seems like the most, most logical and easy solution to a problem from the outside. And Alison will tell you why they can't just leave. And she will also tell you how you can still support them. Okay, so let's play this next session. As a senior police officer for 30 years, I'm now a national and international trainer and consultant in the areas of sexual and domestic violence and abuse. I also quality assure um, domestic homicide reviews from across the country for the, the uh, Home Office. We're going to look at in the next 10 minutes or so why victims of domestic abuse don't leave their partner. And it's all about understanding the complexities of domestic abuse. And I want to start opening up with this very impactive slide. All the figures represent a woman killed by a partner or family member on one day around the world. That's 137 women across the world on average. And the home is the most likely place for a woman to be killed. Statistics for us, on average, two women every week across England and Wales are killed by a current or former male partner. And the ONS statistics show 80 women were killed by a current or ex-partner between April 18 and March 19. And that's a 27% increase then. And we know it's increased further due to the COVID restrictions. I review two to three domestic homicide reviews per month, and there are five of us doing that. So these figures are a devastating reminder of why it's so important for victims experiencing domestic abuse to have that support and somewhere safe to escape to when they can. Women are most likely to be killed by their partner or ex-partner. And as part of the analysis that we are doing, with 124 domestic homicide reviews between 2016 and 2019, obviously pre-COVID, 67% are killed by a partner or ex-partner. And then <clears throat> on average, 75% of domestic abuse murders happen at the point of separation. And about 80% of those are in the first four months. So we know that leaving an abuser can be one of the most dangerous times. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the DASH risk assessment. And we go to question six. Have you separated or tried to separate from your partner within the past year? The highest risk in the first four months. And comments back. If I can't have you, nobody can. If you were ever to leave me, I'll kill the kids. Uh, I know from my experience that police become frustrated and disillusioned dealing with domestic abuse incidents and crimes. And I would often hear, or people, officers would say to me, the victim was uncooperative, the victim was hostile. There's limited corroboration, it's a one on one allegation. There's drugs involved, there's alcohol involved, the victim's going to retract. And you may also be asking yourself, dealing with domestic abuse, why does she stay with him? Why doesn't she just get away from the abuse? Why can't she just leave? Sadly, it's just not that simple. And I'm sure you're familiar with the common barriers to reporting, fear, shame, isolation, not being believed, being blamed. But this is all underpinned by the influence of coercive, controlling behaviour. This is the power and control wheel, a tool to explain abusive and controlling behaviours of a perpetrator of domestic abuse, how it, they're controlling the victim and the children. And there's eight different abuser tactics. And then round the outside, you've got physical and sexual violence. The original power and control wheel was developed by the domestic abuse intervention program in Duluth in America back in the 1980s. It's been around since then. It's such an important tool also to help victims recognise any of the warning signs. And also we've got the stages of patterns of coercive controlling behaviour. 
which have been adapted to help you as police to understand when it's best to intervene and when it's best for you to try and support that victim. A timeline of coercive controlling behaviour that does go up and down. Grooming, early stages of the relationship, and this is with the isolation. Police, you won't often uh, be aware of it. Victim just trying to keep safe. You might get called to the address, but the victim, when you get there, won't want to engage at this point. They're not being deliberately obstructive or uncooperative. They are just trying to manage the situation in a way that makes them feel safe. So by the time the police arrive, the immediate danger, the immediate abuse has passed. And now they're minimising what's happened because they truly believe this is the safest approach for them at this time. And all you can do then is leave contact details. Victims then start blaming themselves for the abuse, try and challenge this issue of blame. And then victims further down the line might start to acknowledge what is happening to them is actually abuse and they may begin to reevaluate the relationship, which could lead to the victim starting then to consider leaving being a reality and then engaging in formal, formal support for the victim. And it's important at this stage that the safety planning is put in place and the victim is supported. We know ending a relationship doesn't equate to ending the violence and the abuse. And the point following separation we've already discussed is the most dangerous. Victims fear of losing their children. Perpetrators use this to maintain, maintain control. We talk about invisible chains. Many women are so controlled that leaving is simply not an option. The control is often invisible to onlookers. Others may even consider the couple are quite happy, but behind closed doors, things can be very different. With a controlling partner, there are not only the barriers to the victim leaving, but also barriers to fully disconnecting once they've left. And these restrictions are the invisible chains. Women can feel so trapped and be rendered so powerless by co controlling, coercive, manipulative behaviours of their abusers. The inability to simply walk away can be linked inextricably with the amount of power an abuser has. A totally controlling partner is not going to let the victim leave and be free of him. He intends to punish the victim if not destroy or kill her, to maintain his sense of power. It's as simple as that. So what do we think victims are going to gain from leaving? Their safety, free from abuse and control, rebuild their self-esteem and confidence, reconnect with family and friends, and their children will no longer see the abuse. However, most of these gains are abstract, hypothetical. They're not certain. They can take time, eight months, a year, or even more. They can lead to a problematic road ahead. They're only probable and they're not definite. This is when their safety is most at risk. What do victims stand to lose? from leaving their loss of their home, financial support, leave the area they know, their personal contact details change, their children have to change school. These losses are certain, immediate, and they're all practical. I mean, look at the most important gain of safety and freedom from further abuse. This has to be balanced against the statistical fact that leaving is so dangerous. So what can you do? Police officers, response officers, investigators. Going back um, to my force, Robert Conlon. Robert Conlon was brought to my attention by concerned response officers. 
due to the number of calls to the address, the escalation that was going on and their absolute concern that Robert Conlon was going to end up killing the victim, his partner. The victim couldn't find the strength to support a prosecution. So what did we do? Evidence-based prosecution using body-worn video, officer statements, witnesses, family, work colleagues, friends, neighbours. They all knew what was going on. So it's about considering all the evidence gathering opportunities from every call to the police. And here's some extracts from the media releases at the time. So first person then to be charged with the offence of coercive controlling behaviour. Due to the strength of the evidence, he pleaded guilty and he was sentenced to four and a half years. Further sentences of six months because he was contacting the victim <clears throat> while he was on remand in prison. He was still trying to exert control in prison and he was succeeding. When Conlon was finally sentenced, the victim went up to the officers and she thanked them. She thanked them for giving her her life back. Victims leaving need the support to do so. <clears throat> of note, through the current analysis of our domestic homicide reviews that we're looking at, where the victims had been murdered just after leaving. Issues we saw in many of those where perpetrators had found out the place where the victim was living. Some of this was through child contact, some of it wasn't. And also there were cases where the victim were in the process, the victims were in the process of getting their locks changed, but it had not yet happened. It's so important not to delay this. So multi-agency support is needed. We speak about the Marrock. We speak about domestic violence, prevention notices and orders. And also, of course, we've got the domestic abuse bill going through. It's actually with the House of Lords at the moment and all those changes. So I'm just going to finish by mentioning DA Matters, Domestic Abuse Matters Change Programme for police. It's training given to police forces across the UK. I've personally delivered um, in over 10 forces. It's about transforming the response to domestic abuse, ensuring coercive controlling behaviour is better understood by frontline staff. There's a map. The pink shows all the forces that have actually adopted the DA Matters training with the black going to be shortly taking it up. And there is a <laughs> list of forces. And some feedback. I just wanted to point out that top one. I have asked, why don't they leave? Why don't they leave to protect the children? I have a far better understanding of why people do not leave. So if you haven't had this training in your force, I would recommend it. So we ask the question, why victims of domestic abuse don't leave their partners? The gains the victims hope for are long-term abstract and hard to get, whereas the risks and losses are immediate, practical and more likely. Officers need to support victims by looking at all evidence gathering opportunities. So, Hopefully I've given you some understanding of how difficult it is for a victim <clears throat> to leave and the support that needs to be put in place around them when they do. So that was Alison's session and a um, bit of a downer, a bit of a heavy subject, but you know, that's what we deal with in policing. Um, I don't think there were any questions about this particular session. If you have any questions, please put it in the comments and start it with a cue. Um, so let me give you my summary of what we've just seen. Okay, so as I said, I'm, I'm taking out the key learning points for you so you don't have to make any notes. Um, women are most likely to be, to be killed by a partner or ex-partner. If you work in the police, you know that already. 75% of DA murders happen at or after separation. And 80% of those happen in the first four months after separation. And that in itself seems like a good enough reason almost um, 
not to leave. Okay, so that's that's one of the reasons. So, you know, victims may not know this, but we know the statistics. So, you know, if we're saying, well, why didn't you just leave? We need to keep in mind that that would actually be a potentially more dangerous thing for the victim to do than to stay. Um, not cooperating with police may seem like the safest option to the victim, um, but do leave your contact details, okay? And it's quite important how you as the police officer who's interacting with that victim engage with her. So um, if you come across as someone who doesn't believe, who blames, who questions, who pushes, that will not make a good impression. If you are someone who's very full of empathy, who's very understanding, builds a lot of rapport, and you just make sure that you're always a safe person for the victim to speak to, you know, whether they, whether she or he wants to make a report or not, then if the victim does get ready to, to do something about it, knowing that someone is in the police who's good to speak to, as in you, will um, possibly encourage that. Um, challenge the safe blaming. So let me just close the window here. So similar with victims of sexual abuse, it is unfortunately also a trait of domestic abuse victims that they tend to blame, them, blame themselves. Um, challenge that, okay? Just let the victim understand that it's not their fault. The pros of leaving are all long-term. You know, what the victim is trying to achieve, what the victim is trying to gain by not leaving, that's a long-term thing. And it's not certain and it's abstract and hypothetical. Whereas if the victim does leave, the cons of leaving, so to speak, they are immediate, practical, existential. Um, you know, many many people are dependent financially on their partner and materialistically, and um, they're far more likely. Um, you know, these losses are far more likely to to happen and to happen quicker, and they're highly dangerous because, as we saw, leaving was dangerous. And what you can do then is, you know, apart from leaving contact details making leaving a lasting good impression as an officer as somebody representing the police or who you know whichever organization you work with and you come across that victim make a good impression build rapport be trust trustworthy make them feel understood make them feel heard and make them feel believed okay and um, challenge every time that they blame themselves and in terms of actually getting a prosecution together, I mean, um, Alison was giving that case from her own force, get in, get the evidence from everywhere else. If the victim doesn't provide evidence, get the evidence from everywhere else. Get the statements from neighbors, colleagues, friends, family. Pe a lot of things do go on behind closed doors, but some people may know. The friends of the victim may know that, you know, he never lets her go outside. He never lets her do this. He never lets her do that. You know, she had to stop seeing them. Um, she's not allowed to stay out beyond a certain time. She can't, you know, get a lift home with one of her friends. He always wants to pick her up and, you know, make sure he knows exactly where she is all the time. Get those kinds of statements because they get the evidence of that pattern of behavior. Like sexual assault, you know, this is co a course of controlling relationship. It's not an incident. It's um, it's a whole pattern of behavior. Um, right. Okay. So, that was Alison's session. Again, if you want to um, be able to look back on all the teaching that you've seen today, all the sessions you've seen today, I've put them all into an ebook together for you. And you can also get a certificate of attendance for this, but you need to register for the conference in the um, policesciencedoctor.com forward slash RFC for rapid fire conference link. And when you are a subscriber through the, using that link, you will also get the discounted link for the ebook later. Okay. Um, next session is Dr. Laura Hammond. Laura is a reader in investigative psychology at Birmingham U City University in the UK. She is also the director of the Crime and Society Research Center there. Amongst other topics, she has conducted a lot of research on geographic profiling using the where and when of offending to identify the who. She will tell us information we'll be able to use when prioritizing the suspects we need to look into. And I'm going to play Laura's session now. Hi there. My name's Dr. Laura Hammond. I'm Director of the Crime and Society Research Centre at Birmingham City University. And in this session today, I'm going to be talking about how we can use criminal spatial behaviour to help inform investigative decision making and various different operational strategies. This is somewhat of a whistle stop for, but I am going to provide a range of references as well as resources for further reading should you want to know more about 
any of the topics covered during the session. Crime location is one of the most consistent, reliable and objective elements of any form of criminal behaviour and as such it has an awful lot to offer with regards to guiding investigative strategies and decision making. The locations in which crimes are committed are not random but rather the result of a range of different decision making processes on the part of the offender and a range of research works have explored the different factors influencing where crimes occur. Like all of us, criminals are most comfortable operating in areas with which we're familiar and so tend to stay relatively close to home or around key points or hubs of their normal daily activity. So work by Brantingham and Brantingham in 1981 mapped out the typical structure and patterning of offender spatial behaviour, showing that it related very closely to their non-criminal daily activities. The residence is typically a hub for offending and offenders move out from this in order to commit their crimes, encountering opportunities and potential targets for offending as they move along the routeways between their hubs in their normal awareness space. They will though be subject to a range of decision processes governing where they decide to target. These will relate to the costs and efforts associated with accessing that target and potential risks involved, along with perceptions as to the potential gains and benefits of accessing that particular target. Because offenders tend to commit crimes within their normal daily activity spaces, often crimes are committed in locations that are relatively close to the offender's home. In this table here, we see the average distances for a range of different crime types for offences committed in a borough of London. And what we see is that generally speaking, most offences were committed within two kilometres of the offender's home. The average for all crimes was just slightly over two kilometres. But what we also see is that it does vary extensively for different types of crime. Those that are property offences, which tend to involve a higher degree of targeting, more planned considerations, tend to occur slightly further away from home as a result of these rational choice considerations that I referred to. And those that are committed against the person, so things like assault, indecent assault, ABH, tend to occur much closer to home, often because they're spontaneous opportunistic offences that occur within the normal daily activity space. If we plot the frequency and likelihood of offending relative to distance from home, what we see is a substantial decrease in offending rates as distance from the home increases. And this is referred to as distance decay. Whilst the nature and form of this decay does vary by crime type, and in the example here, we can see that property offences tend to be committed at proportionally greater distances at higher frequencies than crimes committed against person. But we do see this pattern of decreasing in offending rates with increased distance from the home across crime types. And this has been observed for samples of offenders from around the world. We also know from research into the spatial patterning of crime that serial offenders tend to commit their crimes centered around their home, that the home provides an anchoring point or base for their criminal activity. Cantor and Larkin found that the majority of offenders committed their crimes within the area in which they lived. And they showed that if you drew a circle, the diameter of which was the distance between the two furthermost crimes in a series, that in 87% of cases, the offender lived within that circle so within the area circumscribed by their crimes. Stuart Kind applied navigational methods to the case of the Yorkshire Ripper and showed that the centre of gravity, so the point that is simultaneously the minimum possible distance from all of the crimes in a series, could provide a useful means of predicting the home location of the perpetrator of those offences. And subsequent work by Cantor and Gregory and others have shown the offenders live 
in close proximity to the center of gravity of their crimes. So the practice of using these patterns to inform such operational activities is typically referred to as geographical or geographic profiling. There are a number of different methods and computerized systems that can be used for making geographical profiling predictions. These use the decay functions to characterize the distance patterns for different criminal cohorts, apply these to each of the crimes in a series, and then combine the different levels of probability allocated to all of the different regions around the crimes in order to identify a central high priority hub of the offending pattern. And what you get is an output that indicates a high probability or high priority area of the offence distribution where investigative strategies and resources should be initially targeted. Geographical profiling predictions, though, can also be made using much simpler methods. There has been a range of research that has shown that offenders tend to live relatively close to the centre of the circle comprising their offence distribution. And in a number of cases, it's proven a very accurate means of predicting likely offender base locations and providing a means of prioritising amongst offenders piece of research we did a while back now looked at where the actual perpetrators of offence series featured in ranked prioritisations of all known offenders operating within an area and offenders were ranked on the basis of different geographical features of the offence pattern. So they were ranked for example on the basis of how close they lived to the centre of the circle to the centre of gravity of the distribution, to the first offence in a series, to the last offence in a series, or on the basis of the high probability, high priority area identified using different functions within a geographical profiling system. And what we found was that in the majority of cases, sometimes as many as 70 or 80 percent, offenders lived within the top 20 of all ranked offenders, which totaled in the hundreds, operating and known to operate in those areas. And in this table, we can see the percentage of cases in which the actual offender ranked in the top 5% of the prioritised rankings of offenders. Danielle provides an example of geographic profiling in practice with regards to an investigation into seven sexual assaults committed in Bath in 2005. What they did is conducted a geographical profiling analysis and used this to target in on the patterning of the victim's movement prior to the assaults occurring. On the basis of the geographical profile, they implemented a decoy operation around the centre part of the city where the victims had all been active prior to the assaults occurring. And as a result of this activity, they subsequently arrested and charged the offenders. The spatial patterning of crime has also been found to be very effective as a means of linking crimes to a common offender. So in one study, looking at the degree of accuracy to which linked and unlinked crime pairs could be matched, it was found that the geographical um, elements of the offences, so the intercrime distances, provide much better discrimination accuracy and were much better at discriminating linked and unlinked pairs than behavioural elements of the offences or temporal proximity of the crimes. Patterning of crime can be used to target resource distribution and this approach relies on the analysis of spatial patterns and trends in crime occurrence. O'Neill provides an example of how resource allocation could be tailored and targeted depending on levels and distribution of crime in different geographical regions of a city. And they found that different police responses could be allocated more effectively, ensuring that the right people were in the right numbers in the right places, addressing the right issues and concerns if geographical clustering of offences was considered. And Bullen provides an example of how the geography of crime can be used to develop partnership approaches. 
by identifying vulnerable localities with high levels of drug use and drug using offenders, as well as high areas of acquisitive crime in neighbouring parts of the city, they were able to introduce specific multi-agency interventions that directly impacted on crime rates, reducing burglary and vehicle theft across the area. Those are just a few examples of the way in which spatial patterns in crime and spatial behaviour can inform investigative strategies and decision making. If you'd like to know a bit more, you may find the following resources useful. Thank you for listening. So that was Dr. Laura Hammond from um, Birmingham City University on geographic profiling. Um, if there are any questions about this particular uh, session, please put it in the comments now. Um, I have an interest in geographic profiling. I did my MSc thesis on it and uh, I find the topic very fascinating because it is so useful in narrowing down where to search for an offender and um, where you start investigating when you've got a lot of suspects. So my notes from this session, uh, crime location is the most consistent, reliable, objective element of criminal behavior. So I know that um, offender profiling has had a lot of fascination in the media and in the public because it's so, it almost seems like magic, but actually geographic profiling or spatial analysis or you know the analysis of spatial criminal behavior is a lot more reliable and is objective and you know can be assessed with data and can be used in investigations very well. Um, offenders tend to offend within their normal daily activity spaces that is close to home. Now, Dr. Hammond mentioned um, that she showed, us, she showed us a table there of the average distances traveled to specific crimes. You need to keep in mind that, you know, I think for rapists it's less, you know, something like 1.6 kilometers that they, they travel in order to commit a rape. You need to keep in mind, though, that that doesn't apply to every country because the geography, the, top, the topography, you know, what the, what the area looks like varies from country to country. So there was some um, research in New Zealand, for example, where offenders travel much further distances to offend. So, you know, this 1.6 kilometers would not apply to them. So most, most of the geographic profiling research has been done in the UK and America. So keep that in mind when you're looking at these um, distance statistics. Acquisitive, um, for acquisitive crimes, um, offenders will actually travel further from home because they have to go to a static location to steal from that location. Whereas violence can usually happen closer to the home because it can be um, started or triggered or initiated spontaneously with moving victims. You know, violence is against victims, uh, against people who move around and the offender doesn't have as much control over where they encounter those victims as they would over something static that they want to steal from. Um, not only crime locations, but also encounter sites um, can be used for geographic profiling. Now, you, uh, Laura mentioned that crime in Bath. So that was um, a crime where women were raped, um, you know, on Saturday, Friday nights. And what, how they actually did the, did the geographic profiling was really smart. So they, they did very detailed statements with the victims and they plotted the paths from where they had walked from the town center to their home and they could then identify those common places where all those victims had been and where the offender was probably you know hanging around lying in wait to spot a victim walking on her own to then follow her so he wasn't attacking her that was the encounter site he was then following her and when he felt safe to to attack her he did that so it was plotting the whole routes that they had taken from the town center and the distance between crimes and series is more reliable, is a more reliable linkage factor than time or behavior, because time or behavior can also be dependent on others. Um, do we have we have a question? Mirko Fernandez. Is it possible to identify geographic areas with higher levels of vulnerability to online sexual exploitation targeting based on bandwidth access? Oof. Um, that I don't know. I have to admit, Mirko, um, I don't know much about online sexual abuse. I think the the dark web is something that it is is a completely different area, but it's a growing area, and I haven't got much experience in that. So unfortunately, I can't answer that. Apologies, and I'm not going to waffle around it. I I don't know. Um, do we have any other questions about this? I'm not going to try and pronounce this um, this name because um, I like it when people practice my name and know how to pronounce it properly and I don't want to mess it up. 
um, Aisha know perhaps. Will you share this conference on the YouTube page? Can I watch it later? Yes, you can. It will stay on YouTube. Um, it will stay on the Twitter feeds, on the Facebook feeds, and it will also be um, as, a, as a whole thing, as a whole event on the website. And also I'll extract the single sessions from it with the introduction and with the discussion so that you can um, rewatch a video, video that you're particularly interested in. Okay. Um, right. So what I'm going to do next is I want to thank our first sponsor. So the IACA, the International Association, Association of Crime Analysts, they actually um, provided a short video that we're going to play for you now. Or we're not. Perhaps let me hang on. Let me let me do that. The International Association of Crime Analysts is actively committed to serving crime and intelligence analysts all over the world. With over 4,000 members from 67 countries, we are actively expanding our membership and developing our services. Our certification program sets a high standard for analysts globally. The Law Enforcement Analyst Foundation, or LEAF, and the Certified Law Enforcement Analysts Program, CLEAR, provide accreditation for both entry-level and experienced analysts. We also facilitate coaching and mentoring for our members. The IACA's professional training series provides analysts with all the skills they need, offering classes online and in person in tactical analysis, problem analysis, computer applications, crime mapping and much more. In addition, our annual conferences and symposiums provide unique professional development and networking opportunities. We'd be delighted if you could join us for our conference this year, which will be held in Las Vegas, Nevada between the 23rd and 27th of August. Registration is open now. Right, so let me just read something for you um, about the IACA. The International Association for Crime Analysts, or IACA, is an entirely volunteer-run association actively committed to serving crime and intelligence analysts all over the world. The IACA wants all, want all analysts to be able to achieve their maximum potential so that, as analysts, we can ultimately help inform more effective police interventions and improve public safety. The association currently has approximately 4,000 members from 67 countries and are actively expanding. IACA believe that whatever stage analysts are at within their career, they all have something to learn and they all have something to share. So IACA provide a wide range of services which enable both skills development and networking. Whether it's through conferences or international symposiums, training courses, webinars, certification programs, publications, mentoring program, member directory or online forum, members are able to connect with and learn from others on a continuous basis. If anyone is interested in becoming a member of this outstanding community, you can register or find out more from our website iaca.net. Net. Okay, so I'm actually a member of the IACA. Um, at least two of the talks here today are very relevant to three, actually. Three are very relevant to analysts. The one on um, spatial behavior that we've already seen, there's going to be one on la crime linkage and one directly on crime analysis. So um, the analysts are the decision-making centers of police forces. So very, very important to policing. Okay, do we have any questions before I... No, okay. Right, so the next session is by Professor Jane Moncton-Smith. Um, Jane is a professor of public protection at the University of Gloucestershire. She is a former police officer and her passion for working in DA was awakened by the, f by the theory she felt that people are not more outraged about women being murdered by current or former partners when she was still in the police. She became an academic and is now a leading expert on domestic homicide, carrying out domestic homicide reviews for the Home Office and working with relevant charities. Jane is about to show us the stages that lead up to murder in a coercive controlling relationship. Pay attention because you'll probably recognize some of those stages, even you, you know, even though you may think you're in a normal relationship or you have been normal relationships, um, either from your personal life or from your professional experience. I'm going to, to play Jane's sessions for you now. I'm Professor Jane Moncton-Smith and I specialise in a homicide, coercive control and stalking. This narrative where um, it's, it's explained that the homicide happens as a result of spontaneous anger or red mist coming down or somebody just losing control and, and almost accidentally killing their partner. This needs serious challenge because that narrative 
tells us that these homicides are not predictable. And if they're not predictable, uh, that, that's saying that really we can't do anything to stop them. Well, this research really challenges that belief. And we were able to identify eight clear stages that seem to happen in, gosh, the majority of our cases um, before the homicide happened. So the first stage, stage one, is that the perpetrator of the homicide will have a history of certain behaviours. They're almost a type that we can say, yeah, that, that type of person, that controlling, possessive, jealous type of person is more likely to um, indulge in, in a homicide. But it also says a lot of a lot of other things that the, the the relationship with them is going to be very difficult. Um, we didn't always find that, however, that that history was in their criminal record. We found mostly, actually, that they would either reveal that history themselves when they're talking to their partner, or that history would be revealed through their former partners. So it was very common. Uh, in this research to find that they had said things like oh I you know I've got this crazy ex-girlfriend she used to push my buttons she told lots of lies about me that kind of disclosure is actually really really important and should be considered a history the second stage um, is is when two people meet so we found that the, the common characteristics here were that the relationship very often started very quickly, but you know, would be explained away as, you know, we're, we're really in love, we're really passionate about each other. They had said that, you know, the, the person is very intense. They want the relationship to move on very quickly. The, the more important I thing, I think, in stage two is n not just the speed with which the relationship starts, you know, moving in together quickly, maybe a, a, an early pregnancy, early declarations of love, was what the controlling person was actually looking for in stage two. And we found that what they're actually looking for is a commitment. And in their heads, once a commitment is given, it cannot be withdrawn. It's almost as if you, um, as a victim, become a possession and they have rights or, or entitlements to you or, or the relationship. Uh, the third stage is when a relationship is formed. So the two people are now in a relationship and in every case, that relationship was dominated by controlling patterns control is the is the big high risk marker does that person um, try to control where you go who your friends are maybe what you what you wear whether you go to work or not um, there's, there's lots of ways that that people can be controlled but without exception i would say um, this stage stage three is dominated by control possessiveness and jealousy. The fourth stage is what we call the trigger stage. Now the trigger is an event or something that happens that challenges the control that the controlling person has over their victim, their children, the family, uh, the relationship basically. The single biggest trigger for high risk of homicide is a separation, a threat of a separation or, or even an imagined separation. So the control is act, actually being taken away. So that leads us to stage five, which is the response to that trigger, the response to that challenge. So stage five is what we call the escalation stage. So this will be where the controlling person attempts to regain control. So they may become more possessive. They're, 
they may, may become more violent, they may become violent at this point because they're trying to get back the control. They may try begging, they may try crying, they may try love bombing, anything to get that control back, to get that victim back in their life. Now, it may be also that um, the relationship ends. Now, if the relationship does end and the attempts to regain that relationship have not worked, this is when intimate partner stalking starts. And that's why intimate partner stalking is so dangerous. It's already at stage five in this timeline. And it may be that this is a kind of punishment for the person leaving them, but they become kind of fixated or obsessed on that person and just won't let them leave. So what we find in stage five, and it's really important, a number of things can happen. So it may be that the attempts to regain the control actually work and the relationship is reinstated. Um, that means everything just circles back to stage three, so you just go back to the relationship that's dominated by control. It may be that at some point the person accepts that the relationship is over and they, they circle back to stage one where they are a person with a history of control who's looking for their next relationship. If everything does, you know, goes back to stage three, um, what we find is is a constant circling. So you've got the relationship, and then there's a trigger, and then there's an escalation, and it goes back to the relationship again. So we get three, four, five, three, four, five, over and over and over again. And many um, professionals will recognise this this circling, because that you know you you will be constantly called maybe or asked for assistance in relationships where um, these triggers and escalations are, are happening over and over again. The most concerning thing to happen at stage five is that they don't circle and they progress and they progress forward to stage six. Uh, stage six uh, I have called um, a change in thinking. It's a stage where they have moved on from trying to get the relationship back. They have accepted that it's irretrievable, but they're not going to go back to stage one. They are going to pursue this. Then, and, and um, it has been said uh, in in research done by professors Russell and Rebecca Dobash, for example, that it they say that the mindset changes from keeping the person in the relationship to punishing them for leaving it. And this last chance thinking could almost also be described as, as a kind of decision making stage. And when this timeline progresses, this is the stage at which they will decide that homicide is the way that they are going to resolve things. Um, it's a very difficult stage to identify because the behaviours are uh, can be quite strange. There could be um, a sudden calmness where they made the decision so they're not so uptight about it anymore. They know how they're going to resolve it so they become more calm. For others they may well continue with the escalation, continue with the stalking. Their threats um, may be to kill themselves um, and at stage five uh, a threat to suicide should always be uh, considered as a threat to homicide because a threat to suicide at this stage is is not usually a solitary act they may well be considering con killing themselves but they will also be considering killing their partner or children or others um, but once they're in that stage, the next logical stage is stage seven, which is the planning stage. And, you know, in if you're going to think about the crime of passion narrative, then that wouldn't have a planning stage. You know, something that's spontaneous doesn't have a planning stage. But we have looked at hundreds and hundreds of these cases 
and they nearly all contain some kind of planning. And during this stage, they may well be looking at things, um, lots of Google searches we found, you know, how to kill somebody, how to bury a body, how much of this drug will kill somebody. The, the stage eight is the homicide. I think it's really important to say that these things are not inevitable. They can be stopped at any stage in this timeline. I have seen homicides stopped at stage eight, at the stage where there is an actual attempt. They can be stopped at stage one. So the really really positive messages are that when you look at each stage you as a professional may be able to see where you could intervene depending what stage you're in to try and stop this progressing any further it's not inevitable and of course not every case in fact most cases will not get to stage eight but we really do need to be um, looking out um, for those cases that may end at stage eight and especially in the Covid restrictions we have seen a huge rise in control and domestic abuse and unfortunately we've seen a huge rise in homicides as well. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Jane Moncton-Smith. So if you've got any questions about that session, please um, put it in there. Um, I found that really interesting because Jane has gone through over 400 homicide reviews and she has extracted this pattern of this eight-stage process for us. And, you know, did you, did you recognize any of that in your own personal life? Um, so especially the first one, the history, you know, the crazy ex-girlfriend, um, I have heard that, um, and that should potentially raise a raise a red flag because you know people are with each other for a while and then they break up, and you know why does that person apparently suddenly become a bad person? They don't necessarily become a bad person, you know. You maybe you just broke up. So if somebody, I know many people have a lot of negative things to say about their ex partners, and some of them are legitimate. But you know, if somebody is you know saying what Jane was saying, he really pushed my buttons, was telling lies about me. You know, and, and pushing the buttons, maybe that this person was simply trying to go out with her friends and he was against it. And she was then trying to go out with her friends again. And he was, oh, she's really pushing my buttons. I've already told her she's not supposed to do that. So, you know, just, just bear that in mind. So I've, I've made notes of these eight stages um, for you. One is the history, the crazy ex-girlfriend. Two is the quick progression into into a new relationship. So the offender wants commitment. He wants to trap. He wants to have wrap that control around the victim. They want to move in together. He wants to maybe get pregnant very quickly, wants to get married very quickly, wants some kind of commitment. Um, a controlling relationship, you know, often that involves separating the victim from friends and family. You know, in extreme cases, controlling what they eat, what they what they wear, whom they see, and wanting to be with them all the time, not because they're sweet and romantic, but because they want to control the exposure that this person gets to the outside world. The stage four is that this control is challenged in some way. Maybe the person, the victim does try and go and see out friends, go out to see friends or just try and get a job or wear something different or they try to break up. So the most, um, the, Usually that control is challenged by attempted separation or separation. The offender often can't handle that. Stage five is the escalation of pressure to try and get the person back. So either putting more pressure, more intimidation, more man manipulation, more control. Manipulation can look as it look like crying and begging. It's not necessarily violent. Making the person feel guilty, threatening suicide. And Jane said at this stage, the person threatens suicide. That is actually very dangerous for other people as well not just the offender and actually um, an attempt uh, a threat threat of suicide is actually a good predictor of domestic homicide as well one of the few predictors that we have now at this stage if the victim does get pressurized or manipulated into staying with the person the relationship circles back to stage three so one to eight stage five separation pressure is then put on 
the victim. And if they do agree to get back together, they circle back to stage three, which was the controlling relationship. What they can also do is if the offender does accept the breakup, they circle back to stage one. And now you're the, ex the crazy ex-girlfriend or one of the crazy ex-girlfriends, you know, to add to the, um, to the library of crazy ex-girlfriends. Or what gets really dangerous is the if that if it then progresses to stage six, seven, and eight. Stage six is um, the offender realizes the relationship is irretrievable, wants to punish the partner, maybe start stalking them. Seven is planning the murder, and eight is the actual murder. The uplifting bit here, think uh, here, I think is that what um, Professor Moncton Smith actually emphasized at the end. This is predictable. We have this outline now. We understand this pattern now. It can be prevented and intervened at any stage. Okay, so if you see, if you recognize any of this going on, you know, be very aware, speak to the person involved, see what kind of support is out there. Okay, it can be prevented. Jane wrote a book about this, okay, recently released, In Control, Dangerous Relationships and How They End in Murder. If you want that book, um, you'll find the link in the comments. Please post that, um, paste that link into your document of um, useful links that maybe you're keeping whilst you're watching this, and uh, I'm sure you will really enjoy it. The next session is Ginny McKenna. Okay, so we're going to now talk about stress in policing. And believe me, Jenny knows all about stress and policing. Jenny McKenna is an ex-frontline police officer with 21 years of policing experience on the street. She suffered greatly from the experiences on the job and contemplated suicide on more than one occasion to end all the pain. It was only the worry for her dog that kept her from actually going through with it. She made the grave mistake of not reaching out for help and it took her years to recover on her own. And she now supports people like her to do it much better more easily and she gives them the right support. She left the police and she became a health coach. She's one of only 2% of health coaches who are actually accredited and she specializes in helping service, um, serving of former police officers and police stars through stress. So that support she didn't have back then, she now offers that support herself. I'm going to play Ginny's session for you now. Hello. My name is Ginny McKenna. I'm a life coach and perhaps more importantly to you, I'm a former police officer and I spent more than 21 years on the streets of the UK. Yes, I've worked the shifts. I've had the demands placed upon me that are happening to you right at this moment in time. It's not just about dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges of life, is it? It's the additional stuff that comes with being a police officer. So I've been at the fatal road accidents. I've given the death message to loved ones. And I know what it's like when the purse strings are tightened, budget cuts happen, and that impacts resourcing. And when it does, it impacts you, because ultimately the job still has to be done. So the segment I'm presenting today is how to handle stress working for the police. And I think it's important that we understand the definition of stress. Now, depending on which dictionary you choose to look at, there are probably more than a dozen different definitions. But the one that's most important for us, I think, to understand is that stress is the body's natural reaction. It isn't going to go away. But it's a reaction to a challenge or demand. And you may well experience it as a, an emotional, physical or psychological strain or feeling. But it won't go away. But what's important is that it can be managed so that you can live a happy, fulfilling and relaxed life. But I also think it's important that we have to stress here that not all stress is bad. For instance, if you need that additional oomph when you're chasing after an escaped suspect, or you need that additional focus to complete a really difficult report, or you need to be totally on the ball because actually you're next in line to go in front of the promotion board. You need that level of stress. That's how the body works. That's how we react. That's how we, we get things done. However, when stress becomes chronic, how, how do we know? How do we know it's gone too far? How do we know our stress levels are too high? Well, first and foremost, if you're in a, a chronic state of stress, that is that you're continually uh, triggered, then that can be very harmful for your body. So although stress is a natural reaction, we have to be aware that we can't allow it to continue. The process is that you get stressed, you take the action, the stress goes away. But if stress is there all the time, then you could find it starting to impact you. How do you know that? Well, um, are you becoming more forgetful? 
Are you having frequent headaches and pains? Are you suffering with a, a complete lack of energy and focus? Suffering sleep problems? No sleep at all, getting to sleep and waking up and then not being able to get back to sleep. Or perhaps you're actually sleeping much longer than you would ordinarily sleep. And regardless of that, you're excessively fatigued or tired. You may be suffering with stomach upsets, have constipation or diarrhea. Perhaps it's starting to impact your personal life insofar as you begin to have sexual problems. A lack of interest. You just want to roll over and go to sleep. Perhaps you're experiencing weight loss or even weight gain because of your eating habits. You may be using alcohol or drugs to help you relax. That extra beer, that extra glass of wine at the end of a shift that you never used before, but finding it, it's becoming a daily occurrence. And have you noticed that where once you were very smart and you cared a great deal about your appearance, now you could care less? And I get that. I really do. And I also understand that the first thing that's probably going to go through your mind is, well, everyone else seems okay, is it just me? All my mates are dealing with it, how come I can't deal with it? Well, globally, one in four people are suffering from some sort of mental illness. So that would equate to around about 450 million people. And it's estimated that two thirds of those people, 300 million, are choosing to avoid seeking help. Now in policing terms, the Police Federation of England and Wales conducted research in 2016 where they surveyed 17,000 police officers. And of those, 39% who took part in that particular survey said that they had or were seeking help for their mental health. So you're not alone. In the five year period 2013 to 2018, half of the 130,000 UK police officers at the time had taken absence from work due to their mental health related illnesses. Cambridge University, funding police care by Police Care UK, revealed that the rates of PTSD amongst police officers in the UK is five times that of the general population. And this is not a UK phenomenon. It is repeated throughout the policing family worldwide. And I also hear that you're going to say, it's only a bit of stress. What harm can it do? Well, if you're constantly triggered, it can do a significant amount of harm to you. For instance, you may be at greater risk of a heart attack or stroke. Or have a weakened immune system so that you're constantly suffering with infections. That niggling cold, that sore throat, the, the flu-like symptoms that you've had for months just don't seem to go away. You could be at risk of an increased blood pressure, inso insomnia, high blood sugars that will certainly put you at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. You may be experiencing digestive problems such as nausea, vomiting, stomach aches, heartburn and acid reflux. Again, the low sex drive, total loss of interest, can't be bothered. And you know that's putting a strain in your relationships. You may have erectile dysfunction or even impotence. And ladies, your menstrual cycle will almost certainly be affected or stopped altogether. And if you're one of the ladies who's experiencing menopause, well, certainly stress will magnify the symptoms that you're suffering. And let's face it, they're bad enough as it is. You may have fertility problems, become irritable, headaches. If you already have a breathing issue such as asthma, for sure, this could exacerbate that. You may have muscle tension leading to pain, marriage problems, and ultimately suicide. And believe me, no one wants that loss of life. So what would stop you from asking for help? Well, fear and shame. Fear of what people may say. Shame that I can't hack it anymore. But the reality is, it's because you care so much that stress has taken its toll on you. Perhaps you have a lack of insight. You're not aware of, of how impactful stress can be and therefore just dismiss it and minimise it. You don't want to appear weak to your colleagues or family because everyone sees you as this pillar of strength and reliability. Perhaps there are trust issues. Who can you trust to talk to? Or perhaps it's, will they trust me? when I'm recovered. 
a complete feeling of hopelessness. It's gone too far. What's the point? Perhaps you experience practical barriers, such as you need childcare in order to go and get the help that you need. And so you put that in your way. Are you concerned it may affect your status? You're always seen as the strong one. And now suddenly you're feeling like the weak one. Or perhaps you're even concerned that it may impact your career chances. You were going to go for promotion. But what happens when they know that you've suffered with a mental health problem? Do you know, there are lots of simple solutions to help you cope. Guided meditations and breathing exercises are great for changing your physiology. If you change your breathing and slow it down when you exhale, that gives a signal to the body to say, stand down guys, I'm okay, there's nothing to be afraid of. And although it may seem a little bit out there, a little bit off the wall for you, or even a little bit woo-woo, give it a go, because you don't know. And then there's thought interrupters for that negative chatter that goes on incessantly. It's about bringing yourself into the room, grounding yourself, feeling the earth beneath your feet, and then occupying your mind with, with a task. Find five red things in the room, and that will take you away from the negative chatter. We all need uplifting music. We all need a break. So take it, but make sure it's a proper break. Exercise regularly. There's a myriad of information out there in search studies that show it can considerably help change your physiology and therefore help you deal with stress. Eat healthily, plan ahead, make sure that you take food to work that can be stored in the fridge or the freezer that's a healthy option and make sure that you carry a healthy snack option because we all know as a cop you can get kept out on the locusts and never get back for a meal. Try and get seven to eight hours of uninterrupted good quality sleep and I know that's not easy because when you come off night shift and it's a beautiful day guess what everybody else is out making tons of noise but there are ways you can address that. Try and keep the room between 16 and 18 degrees Celsius centigrade. Have blackout blinds to keep out the light, the blue light. Use earplugs for the noise. Make sure you give yourself a routine that leads into a sleep pattern and maintain that on a regular basis. And even on days off, don't be tempted to sleep any longer than six to eight hours because that will only interrupt your sleep pattern. Take walks in nature. Spend quality time with the family. Get back involved with your hobbies and your, your fun activities. Perhaps speak to your line manager about a change of scene or taking a break from the front line because that may be all you need. But ultimately, don't suppress your feelings or thoughts. Don't be afraid to reach out, ask for help and talk about how you feel with someone you trust. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, a respected colleague, a line manager or it could be a professional. But reach out. And if you think you need more help than I've been able to provide you on this video, well, I've collaborated with Police Science Doctor to bring to you an Emergency Stress Pit Stop online course, which will be launching in May. Or alternative, if you wish to work with me on a one-to-one, -one, you can join my Emergency Stress Reset 90-Day Coaching Programme, where you and I can work together on your issues. There will also be a 90-day group coaching programme that will be available shortly. But please, reach out. So very, very important words from Ginny McKenna, reach out, okay? Do it better than she did at the time. The support is there if you need it. I just saw um, a comment here that I'm just going to pop up. Being an officer is not easy and there's no support system for us. Thank you for this conference. Um, yes. Yes, and believe me, you're going to want to come to the Mental Health and Policing webinar. Let me just see if I've got this banner here. No, but we'll, we'll show you the, the banner again later, um, and then you can hopefully put it into your list that you're keeping. So Mental Health and Policing webinar, that's on the 13th of May. Okay, so let me just go through the um, summary of what Ginny said. So there's always going to be stress in policing, okay? Policing is a very stressful job, maybe one of the most stressful jobs um, you could do. But this is about learning how you can handle that stress and still live a happy, fulfilling life. Okay, you should not take that stress home. It should not be permanent and it should not be impacting your life. And there are ways for you to get to that stage. Stress in itself is not bad. Okay, sometimes you need that for a little bit of a kick, kick in adrenaline. But if it is permanent, that is a problem. 
Um, there are some warning signs, changes in yourself, um, such as when you're not socializing anymore, when you're not looking after yourself anymore, you're not um, following your hobbits, hobbies anymore. I didn't, you know, I'm not um, suggesting that anyone is following hobbits, um, but if you have hobbies and you give them up and you find no joy in them anymore, that may be a warning sign. Um, physical symptoms may be problems with sleep, sickness, digestive, sexual changes. But half of all UK police have taken time off due to mental health related illnesses. Okay, you're not alone. If you'd speak up, you know, you most, may still feel funny because policing culture can sometimes be very unforgiving, but it shouldn't be. And we're really trying to change that, especially with the webinar we've got coming up. So do speak up. A lot of people will have gone through the same stuff that you've been going through or that you are going through. There's a risk of heart attack, stroke, immune system, um, worsened immune system, blood, high blood pressure, insomnia, diabetes. And um, the problem is that a lack of insight and a lack of courage prevents people from coming forward. What you can do about it is controlled breathing. So if you are in a panicky state, if you're feeling overwhelmed, really control your breathing. It does a, it causes a lot of changes to your nervous system and your and your brain. Um, there are thought interrupters. So if you are overwhelmed by um, in, intrusive thoughts, like she said, you know, okay, maybe count five red things in the room. Um, take proper breaks. So we're very uh, much tempted in the police to, you know, just not take any breaks. And the sleep routine, I thought it was very interesting what she said about the sleep routine. Obviously, as if you're on a shift pattern, that does mess with your sleep. But do your best to normalize that. So have a routine that leads you into the sleep. You know, that's sometimes like you do with children or babies. Um, you know, you've got bath, dinner, maybe bath time maybe reading, then, you know, have low lights and do that, you know, come up with something like that, that helps you and helps your body understand you're going into your sleep phase now and maybe have a sleep routine. Um, you know, it's like a pre-sleep routine of half an hour or one hour to do that and do that every time. And the other important, uh, the other interesting point you mentioned there was even on your days off, don't budge sleep, you know, stick to your routine and stick to your, um, to the amount of time you usually would, would be sleeping. Um, a healthy diet. So again, with shift work, that can be very, very um, difficult, but bring healthy things into work with you and have healthy snacks on you. Because like Ginny said, you might be, um, you might be protecting a cordon, location control, um, you know, locus control. And, uh, you know, maybe just have a healthy bar, healthy cereal bar, some nuts, um, you know, some berries, something like that. Lots of exercise, hobbies, quality outdoor time, social support, and ask for help. Okay, so Ginny's website is GinnyLife.com. Um, she is a she is a, a certified health coach. She specializes in helping police through stress. And no matter where you are, because this is now all being done online, you can get her help if you want to. And as she mentioned, and as I mentioned previously, we're actually creating a course together that will launch in May. It's called Emergency Stress Pit Stop. It's called Pit Stop because you're in this race constantly as a police officer you need to be in top form the problem is uh, a formula one race car pulls over and gets everything refueled redone changed tightened loosened whatever needs to happen but you as a police officer you don't do that you just carry on in that race you're running yourself into the ground and you're never looking after yourself it will mean you will break down at some point okay so the emergency stress pit stop basically means right you can you know you're looking you're taking a little bit of time to look after yourself then you're going back in. Okay, that's what it does. Um, also, the so this emergency stress pit stop course is going to be the first full feature length course on the Police Science Doctor Academy. However, there are three, two free introductory courses on the Police Science Doctor Academy. One is the um, Behavioral Science in Policing course. That is for anyone who just wants to have a brief overview of you know some of the topics in behavioral science and investigative psychology. That's freely available on the Academy now. And the other one is how to do evidence-based and how to do evidence-based policing in four steps. Really, really popular course. It has been closed for a while. It's going to reopen in a few weeks, though. So to visit the Police Science Doctor Academy, go to the link, copy the link onto your document um, that you're going to see in the comments now. Okay, our next speaker, Professor Gabrielle Salfati. Now she's the director of the IP uh, Investigative Psychology Research Unit at John Jay College of Criminal Justice at the City University in New York. She's part of the first group of people who emerged within the field of investigative psychology and has researched extensively in the fields of violent criminal behavior, offender profiling and linking crimes. Gabrielle is about to tell us about that last point, linking crimes. 
linking crimes together to the same offender, but doing it correctly. The more crimes in a series you can correctly attribute to the same offender, the more pieces to the puzzle you have. Okay, so it's very much in the investigation's interest. Okay, I'm going to play you Gabrielle's session now. My name is Gabrielle Salfanti. I'm a professor of psychology and the director of the Investigative Psychology Research Unit at John Jay College of Criminal Justice which is at the City University of New York. In today's talk, we're going to focus on the issue of linking serial crimes. And we're specifically going to focus on the very real challenges that practitioners face when trying to establish a series. Now, the first thing that we need to think about is what is a series and what do we mean by linking? Well, a series or an number of individual crime scenes that are committed by the same offender over a certain amount of time. The linking process is the ability to identify how each one of these crime scenes may be linked together. And in order to do that, we very often focus on the idea of there being something that is similar from crime scene to crime scene. And it's this similarity that allows us to link them together into a series. Now, Edgar in 1984 identified the issue that he named linkage blindness. And this is the challenge of being able to know what to link on. And unless we know what the best indicators are to link crimes together into a series, we will miss some of those individual crime scenes. And that causes that blindness that doesn't allow us to identify every single crime scene that may be part of the same series. The other practitioner issue that we're going to focus on, what are the key criteria that are the most useful to link crimes on? Many crime analysts will often have data sets or um, computerized systems or even files where they have maybe up to about 300 different indicators that they could focus on in order to link one crime scene to another. So one of the things that would be useful for us is to be able to reduce down these 300 or so indicators that we may have to the top, let's say 10 indicators that are the most useful to us in terms of identifying the sameness between one crime scene and another and identify that they may be linked together as part of the same series. The third thing that we need to focus on is the evidence that supports this linking process, particularly in terms of the most useful indicators and the process of linking itself. So the process needs to be evidence-based, which is the idea that the knowledge that we use to link crimes is based on research. So let's look at linking as a number of pieces to a puzzle. And each one of these pieces is a question that we need to ask. So what are these key practical questions or the key practical issues that we have when we approach a particular crime scene? The first thing that we want to know when we're actually trying to understand the idea of a serial offender and being able to look at each one of these crime scenes in order to link them together into a series, we need to ask the question of, well, if we are focusing on sameness, do they consistently engage in the same behaviors at each individual crime scene? As part of all of that, we also need to understand the context in which these crimes occurred. Because although an offender may be engaging in certain behaviors that may be similar from crime to crime, they're still engaging within a particular context. And the idea is that that context may actually influence how consistent they are. It may change how they're actually engaging with the crime scene. So we need to understand how different types of contacts and different types of situations can impact that consistency, that sameness that we're trying to identify. So these are all some of the most basic questions that we need to ask before we even start the process is what do we actually know about what a series looks like and how consistent a person is? So let's look at this whole concept of behavioral consistency. Now, behavioral consistency 
is the idea that an offender will engage in the same behavior or similar behavior from crime to crime. And it's this similarity that will allow us to link the series. We also need to understand that, or we need a baseline, if you want, of knowledge to understand, well, just, well, before even just how consistent they are, are they consistent? Once we figure out that question, the next one then is, how is that consistency displayed? How consistent are they? Are they always consistent? Or are there changes? Or are offenders actually inconsistent? And if they are inconsistent, i.e. they don't display the specific same behaviors across the crime series, well, what else can we use in order to link that series into one uh, series of offenses? The next thing that we need to think about as well is that when we are seeing certain aspects of inconsistency, it may actually be due to natural changes that shouldn't be mistaken for inconsistency, but more part of our understanding of human behavior in general and also criminal behavior. So offenders will experiment, particularly in the beginning of a series, and then they may choose a method as they move on. So there's going to be an apparent inconsistency but if we know that the experiment early on we can take that into account when we're aiming to link people develop over time as well and they learn so one of the things that we need to look at is is there a difference between an offender who starts their series when they're young when there is more space for development um, both in general and also in terms of their criminal career and is there a difference from someone who starts their crime later on and can we tell what kind of offender we have on our hands based on what we're seeing at the crime scene. Also, offenders will learn, obviously, as they go along in terms of how they're engaging in their behaviors. How can we see that learning? And we need to be able to identify that and not get distracted by it in terms of seeing it as an inconsistency, but instead understand it as a consistent process that the offender goes through. In 2005, we published the first study in serial homicide and understanding the serial homicide process, trying to sort of, if you want, bust some of the myths and establish some baselines and follow that on by another study in 2007. Now, those were the first two studies that were done on homicide. And what they aim to do is to understand the key question of what are the most important behaviors to focus on and why? And how should we approach the linking process? What those first two studies showed us at the time was that what people were highlighting in the literature as being the most important indicators were in fact the least reliable in terms of using them to be able to identify sameness across a series. The other thing that these first two studies showed us is that based on what we knew at the time and what we could identify, there, were, there was more inconsistency in people's behavior than there was consistency, which highlighted the very real practical issue of linking serial crimes. So the questions then started around that time in terms of well, what steps do we need to take in order to be able to provide the tools needed for linking to be able to link these crimes together. And so the research focused on what were the key behaviors that we need to focus on that are the most useful? So that was narrowing it down to those 300 odd behaviors down to maybe the top 10. And also focus on how do we understand a series and how do we understand that whole idea of behavioral consistency in order to be able to identify patterns that offenders might have. That is where this field started in terms of providing the empirical evidence. Now, we've come a long way during that time. And to illustrate some of the work that we have done, I'm going to show you a case example of serial rape. So let's imagine there has been 10 rapes. And the one feature of those 10 rapes that the police have identified as being important is that all victims were gagged. So an individual behavior that the offender engaged in. And based on that individual behavior, these 10 rapes have been hypothesized to have been committed by the same offender. Now imagine that you have an 11th rape. And in that rape, the victim was bound. So the question then becomes, is this last victim part of the same series? Now, if you focus on the individual behavior 
i.e. the gagging and the binding, you would say, no, that 11th rib is not part of it. But if you focus on the psychological meaning of that behavior, you might start to broaden the field of inquiry and understanding, and you might be able to say that, yes, this 11th rape may be linked to the first 10. So what is it that we mean when we talk about psychological meaning versus the overt behavior? Well, when we look at the idea of gagging someone and binding someone, essentially the offender is engaging in the psychological process of control but they're controlling the victim in different ways, such as the gagging and, and the binding. One is by making sure that the victim doesn't scream, and the other one is making sure that the victim doesn't run away. What they may be doing is adapting the individual behavior to that different context based on what is going on, but ultimately what they're trying to do is control the crime scene in order to be able to engage in the act of rape. So these are some of the things that we look at when we're trying to understand what exactly we need to focus on at the crime scene and how. So it's not just about the behavior, but it's about what the behavior means psychologically. When we also talk about the meaning of the behaviors, we need to think about the fact that we are engaging in the process of linking serial crimes within the legal process. And we understand crimes as part of the legal process. Now, legally defined crimes such as homicide and rape and robbery, etc., are legally defined. This may not actually match directly into what we understand about psychological factors of behaviors. So let me give you an example. Imagine you have four different types of crimes that you are looking to see whether they are committed by the same offender. You have an assault, later on, a rape is committed, another rape is committed, and you have a sexual homicide. Now, because you have three different types of crimes, you may have difficulty understanding how these may be related to the same series. You might say that there's a linkage between the two rapes, but you may miss the assault and you may miss the sexual homicide, which is what Edgar was talking about when he mentioned linkage blindness. This is if we focus on the legally defined type of crime. But what if we took it one step further and added that psychological aspect to it? If we look at it as legally defined crimes, we see them as separate. But if we look at it from a psychological standpoint, we actually see a series of assaults that develops into a series of sexual assaults. So there is some consistency here. An offender assaults a person. The next time they assault them again, but part of that assault is rape. Then they assault them again and there is again sexual activity and then they assault them again and not only is there sexual activity but they also kill the victim so we're seeing not only that there is a consistency but there's also a development of the behavior there's a change in the behavior and there's even an escalation and so this is what i was talking about when i was talking about the whole idea of development, experimentation, development, and learning. This is my, this might be what we're seeing here, and this is how it would play out in real life. The question still becomes, well, how do we identify that these four legally defined different crimes actually have the same psychological pattern between them, and how do we establish that link in order to be able to identify the series and ultimately link it to a particular type of offender? So this has given you a little bit of an overview, I hope, of some of the work that is going on in serial crime and some of those key questions that we're asking, identifying why we're asking them and how they can actually help us narrow down the process of linking and making it more evidence-based in terms of identifying the key psychological questions and ultimately being able to link series and then link them to the type of offender who's most likely to have committed that series. This takes us to the end of this talk on serial crime. I wanted to finish my talk by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate, and I hope that you found the information useful. I'm going to finish my talk by providing some links to further resources. If you want to hear more about the Investigative Psychology Research Unit and the research that we're doing there, if you want to hear more about upcoming events and webinars, and if you want more information on our training courses that are specifically tailored for practitioners in the field of investigation and the analysis of crime. Thank you very much for participating in this talk today. 
Okay, thank you to Professor Gabriel Salfati. So, um, linking crimes, the, linking the correct crimes to the correct offenders gives us more pieces to the puzzle. In one offense, somebody may have seen a car and can describe the car. In another offense, the person may have seen roughly how tall the offender is, and they may have seen something else identifiable about them. And if you put that together, you have a lot more information to go on. So it's very important to find out which crimes were committed by the same offender, and that is crime linkage. Um, so my uh, notes from Gabrielle's talk were offenders experiment in the beginning, expect to see more variants. So crime linkage is to some extent dependent on the consistency of um, what the offender does in one crime to the next. But especially in the beginning of a series, there will be variants because there's experimenting. Something works, the offender might do it again. Sometimes something doesn't work, the offender may change it. So offenders learn from mistakes and successes, expect to see adaptation. Look at the meaning of behaviors rather than just the individual acts. The overall meaning may be the same within which various behaviors may differ. So she was giving the example there of um, the rape series with the 10 victims who were gagged, who you know had something put in their mouth so they couldn't scream. And then the 11th victim was actually bound. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, they are not linked because if we look in, in, in the other research, I've seen it called a theme, you know, so the theme or the overall meaning, as Gabrielle calls it, is controlling the victim. And maybe those 10 victims were screaming and the 11th victim was so intimidated she didn't scream, but he had to restrain her physically in some way. So it doesn't mean that these, are, these offenses are not linked. They're all um, tactics to control the victim. Okay, so... Um, that was all the links to um, that Gabrielle showed in the end um, at the at the end of her slides there in the ebook as well, and um, so you can check the research yourself and you can go straight to um, the John Jay um, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Chant, hello, Chant. Um, I understand that analysts use crime scene behavioral cues to link crime. Would Salfati's work suggest analysts infer psychological meaning from the physical clues as well? Is this typical? Um, Physical clues. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by physical clues, but yes. So something like crime linkage is something that can be done by investigators or detectives or crime analysts. So um, we are looking at the um, the behavioral cues, and it, by physical clues, do you? I'm not quite sure what you mean, Chant. If you want to just quickly um, specify that, so I can try and answer the question for you. Um, but it's. It depends on what you're working with. So if the offender is leaving physical clues, if the offender is leaving behavioral clues, you know, use try and use both of them. If you remember back to Dr. Laura Hammond's talk, geography is the most reliable factor to link on or to make any patterns with. But um, yeah, so such as gagging. Yeah, so... So you're saying that gagging is a physical clue there. Um, you could say it's behavioral because the the overall meaning is the is the um, is the control. So what Gabrielle was saying is that you've got um, you've got a control theme. Within that control theme, maybe things like restraint, gagging, threatening a victim, and there may be other themes. So I've, again, I've I've seen I've seen other research where they where they talk about these themes. So one is the control which we've just talked about. The other thing can be something like um, pseudo intimacy, where you know the, the, of the, the offender, whilst they're raping a victim and completely terrifying her, they're trying, you know, they're trying to be emotionally intimate, maybe complimenting her, trying to reassure her, you know, maybe coming up with some, some kind of things to say that will make me maybe perhaps make her feel sorry for him. So there are different themes and the difficult different acts here of gagging, tying up, they were in a in this theme. So the offender may be adapting to the situation, which is why those situational factors are less reliable in terms of linking, unlike location, which is under his control to to the largest extent. But you know if we link on theme, we're more reliably linking the right crimes together. So I hope that answers your question chant um question chant. Um, this is, thank you very much. I'm just going to show that. It's a fantastic comment. Thank you very much, Jim. Jim is the host of the um, Community Safety Podcast. Really worth checking out if you haven't already. Um, what are you saying? Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, 
Right. So just to remind you again, if you want a certificate for coming to this conference today, then please register. And um, also when you register, you, bec you automatically become a subscriber to the free email list. And then you also get the linked discount, the discount link emailed to you later on. And you will have everybody's talk in there. You will have all the research re research links and you will have everybody's, um, you know, where, the speakers, where they work, you know, so you can get in contact with them. Not to stalk them, but you know, to you know, which university they work at and how you can can get in touch with them, right? Okay, so the next talk we have is Professor Jason Roach. Uh, Jason is professor at the Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Huddersfield and director of the Applied Criminology and Policing Center. He is also the editor of the Police Journal. Um, Jason has coined the term self-selection policing and works a lot with the psychology of influence or nudge psychology to prevent crime. And this is what he's talking about today. I'm going to play you Jason's talk now. My name is Jason Roach and I'm a professor of psychology and policing at the University of Huddersfield. I'm going to use this very short presentation just to try and introduce the idea of using psychology of influence in order to reduce crime and prevent crime. Preventing crime um, makes you think of locks, etc. straight away, doesn't it? But there's got to be more to it than that, and there is more to it than that. It's about influence. It's about influencing people's thinking and consequently, hopefully, their behaviour. Um, now, there are lots of influences out there that we're influenced by, the main one being, like my little fish there, probably peer pressure. OK, anyone that's got any children out there will know that if you want your child to do what you wanted to do, get another child to tell it, particularly that's with teenagers. They listen to each other. Peer pressure is a probably the best uh, psychology of influence example that I can give you. But there are others. But when we're talking about preventing crime, who are we actually trying to influence, straight persuade? Um, well, there's of course those that who committed or are thinking about committing it and trying to dissuade them, trying to put them off um, to doing it. But there's also those who might become victims, i.e. most of us, of crime, particularly if you live in a high risk burglary area, for example, um, you need to be more a heightened kind of response to what you can do in order to reduce that risk of you being a victim of burglary. Um, so there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done around the potential victims and influencing their decision making and, and consequently hopefully their behaviour. And then there's the third group of people who uh, may or may not consciously or unconsciously um, influence kind of crime prevention and that's called police who are very consciously do that in their patrols putting people off committing crime etc. But also unconsciously so people that are just kind of walking past a, a moment when somebody is thinking of committing a crime that may put them off. We need to think about how we can uh, also influence these people. For a crime to occur, you need opportunity. In order to reduce crime uh, and to reduce the opportunities, then we need to do things about the environment in which they occur um, and the situations. For example, increasing the effort, making it more difficult for someone who's thinking about committing a crime um, to actually think, well, is it worth it? So is it worth trying to cut open that great big chain, for example, on that ATM? Um, might not get much out of it, what's the point? Might walk away. Increase the risks, of course. Well, if I think I'm going to get caught, or at least the risks are heightened, then, then you know, the CCTV about it or something, then, then uh, uh, you know, I'm probably going to be deterred, at least if I'm thinking rationally. Um, reducing the reward. So if I do manage to get inside that ATM there and I get the cash out, but there is a mechanism by which if you do try to force an entry into an ATM, ink, indelible ink is squirted all over the money, making it worthless. What's the point? Um, reduce provocations as well so that I'm not, don't feel that, you know, I'm, I'm provoked into committing a crime. Um, and then removing the excuses as well. So making it difficult for me to neutralise um, my actions and my thinking. So I may rationalise or, or neutralise, in, in fact, the, uh, the any guilt I might have for committing a burglary by saying that the people that live there, they're insured anyway and they'll get their stuff back. Not just a little bit more subtle. Anyone recently been in a shop where they've gone to pay and um, the person behind the tiller said that will just be pound fifty. That will just be $1.23. The insertion of that word just, the idea is the nudge. It makes you feel like you've got a good deal. Nudge 
originated from, from um, Sullivan Sunstein's work, a behavioural economist, about what it is that we need to do or how we can influence people's decision making by just rearranging the architecture of mind, if you like, or the way that they make decisions. And that is not to take people's choices away, just to extensuate almost and are just to put in something in bold in a list so that they identify with it and that they kind of more likely to choose that, the more pro-social option we're told. So what's the difference between the sort of situation of crime prevention measures and trying to reduce the opportunities for crime and the more subtle nudge? I mean, they're very, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're related to definitely. Um, so what's the difference? Well, keep off the grass is very much a situational crime prevention sign. Keep off, you know, don't go on it, that's it. The rules are there, don't break them. This one, I think, is more of a nudge. Do not disturb tiny grasses dreaming. So the thing with nudges is nudges are specifically that used to influence certain groups of people. In this case, people who actually care about grass and lawns, reminding them not to walk on it. You know, it's not going to keep your hardened grass walker offender off of it, but it will keep most people who've got a bit of a conscience off. Plus, it's nice. Um, so nudging, um, how do you do it? What are they? Well, nudges need to be nuanced. There needs to be differences between them and they need to be targeted at specific demographic groups, particularly groups of people. Um, they need to speak to them and you need to understand how they make decisions in order to be able to speak more to them. Usually appealing to people's pro-social side, the right thing, if you like. They need, often they're unconscious, they tap into, as I said before, existing bias. Um, and default decision making. People like my little fish um, is going against the grain. People tend to go with the grain. So they will they, unconsciously, they will follow other people. Discerning. Now you should target those on the cusp of choosing the pro-social option. It's just those that are about to choose the pro-social thing, you know, to not walk on the grass, for example. They're thinking about it. Um, you, you know, you make them think about it, they decide not to do it. Not those who really have a disdain for the law and any rules, they'll just walk on the grass anyway. Give people a choice, so don't take the ch choice away. It's not binary, do it or don't do it. There are other choices, yeah? Um, and you just accentuate using a nudge, the choice. Um, my, yeah, going back to the shop scenario, um, that will just be £1.50, doesn't take my choice away from going to any other shops. It's not saying you have to come in this shop, but it's just nudging me into thinking that this shop is value for money and that'll come again. They have to be easy, they have to be easy to explain and implement nudges otherwise if they get too complex then the, the people don't, it doesn't have an effect on people because they don't, they don't get it, they don't grasp it, yeah, particularly at an unconscious level. They have to be inexpensive which is why police um, are, are increasingly liking the kind of the nudge approach to try and reduce crime because it's got to be cheap so it might be a leaflet, yeah, a, a very well designed leaflet but it might be a leaflet, it's not hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of CCTV, for example. And they have to be testable. So you have to know whether they actually work or it has had an influence on people's decision making. Um, if it doesn't, then, um, you know, um, modify the nudges or, or move on, come up with some others. We did a quick study um, here of burglary, um, student victimisation of burglary in Durham, which is in the north of England. Uh, um, and um, the police had information about kind of the, like people that lived in these areas, these high risk areas, but I wanted a bit more information about them if we we're going to nudge them into being more security conscious because a lot of the burglaries that were happened were insecure, people were leaving windows and doors open in multi occupancy dwellings as well. Um, uh, and so I designed a questionnaire where the police survey, where the police would knock on the doors or police cadets would knock on the doors and ask question, this, this survey to the people that lived there so that we got more information on, on who lived there and possibly nudged them. And within that, um, within the questions were things like, do you know that you will be deemed negligent if you leave the doors open and your insurance company won't pay out? Do you know that you live in a high uh, burglary area, etc.? So there were certain nudges in there as well. and. Um, by just doing the survey, you know, we wanted the data in order to then come up with some other interventions in, in which to to kind of, you know, try to to, to um, nudge the thinking around the crime prevention um, and burglary reduction. But the actual conducting of the survey itself had an effect. Um, in fact, when we compared to the same periods, um, so the survey, for example, when it ran um, for the six months that was that it was um, administered. We compare the, the same months for the previous three years and it went down considerably 
and that was just because people were being primed um, and, and they were kind of being nudged into thinking hang on I live in a and they began to obviously I think uh, start to start to take more precautions in terms of locking their doors before they went out etc it also probably had an effect on a lot of the local um, burglars if you like because um, they knew that this was going on um, and they probably laid low for a little and, and didn't commit as many burglaries either way or both um, burglary went down just because of the survey uh, and the administration of the survey and it led to a couple of informed student focused uh, leaflets around don't be the one to make it easy for them and uh, flex it before you exit I wish I'd come up with flex it before you Brexit it might have uh, solved a few problems over here in the UK and make sure that all the windows are locked so it's a very much a, a student focused nudge that uh, for a leaflet at the front door inside of the front door before they go out just to make sure that um, you know they've locked all the doors and windows leave you with the locus of control which is about all of us really yeah it's a personality thing if you feel that you have a strong internal locus of control then that means that you have constructed control over your destiny so that you can reduce your chances for example of becoming a victim of crime um, it's within your hands you can minimize you can't eradicate them but you can minimize the chances of you risks of you becoming a victim of crime whereas if it's external okay you've got an external a strong external as a locus of control then you will think well it doesn't matter what I do I live in a high uh, crime area I'm going to be likely to be a, crime, uh, a victim of crime whatever I do it's not worth thinking about so I think locus of control is important in understanding as well in how we might influence people in order to to kind of um, become more security conscious and and you know uh, ergo to, to reduce their chance of becoming a victim and reduce prevent crime Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope that's been useful um, and please don't hesitate to contact me should you have any further questions and I hope that um, you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you Jason for that. Um, so before I get to the summary, there's um, a comment I would like to respond to from Rudawan Benz, due to manpower, the prevention of crime on a station level are neglected sometimes. This causes an increase in most burglaries and theft. I have noticed if I dedicate my efforts to prevention of crime via patrols, it decreases the element of having a complaint. Now, if you're talking about a complaint as in a uh, call for service or a crime report, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, so patrolling is can be very effective if you're doing it in the right places. Random patrols are pretty useless, but if you go for the hotspots of crime, where the most crimes happen at the times they happen, or hotspots of harm, harm and crime are sometimes completely different things. But if you go and patrol where the hotspots are, you can greatly reduce crime. And there's been a lot of research. It was one of the most established um, pieces of knowledge in evidence-based policing that hotspots, targeted hotspots patrols um, are very, very effective at preventing crime. So um, my summary from Professor Jason Rose Roach's um, talk here was nudge can impact all those in the middle not hardened criminals or passive victims so if we've got a spectrum here here are the hardened criminals they're going to do whatever they want no matter what the law says they're not going to be impacted by nudge we've got passive victims here who just flow through life and think that nothing is within their control things are just happening to them you know it's very very miserable really if you if you can't take control of your life you know you're always going to be completely vulnerable to everybody else's choices because you never make your own so these two extremes are not going to be influenced by nudge nudge really targets those people in the middle, those who are at the cusp of doing the right thing. So with the grass, for example, you know, I'm not a criminal, but I might walk over grass. But if there's a sign saying, keep off the grass, or in, and especially keep off the grass because the grass is sleeping, I would stay off. So it's about people who are at the cusp of doing the pro-social thing. And it's not prescriptive. It doesn't tell you what to do. It presents a list of options. You can walk on the grass, you can stay off the grass. But what it does, and Jason said that really well, it just highlights the option that um, that we would want you to take. Um, 
So I probably already said everything now. Uh, crime prevention, increase risk, reduce reward, reduce opportunity, increase effort. So that's normal traditional crime prevention stuff. Nudge is more subtle. It gives another option and highlights a preferred option on a list, accentuates the desirable pro-social choice. Need to understand the decision-making process of those to be nudged, and it needs to be cheap. So when he was talking about that um, Durham example with the students, first you need to research the students and do these surveys to find out how they make the decisions, and then you can try and influence that decision. And it targets those on the cusp of doing the pro-social thing, as we already said. Okay, at this point, I'd like to second um, to thank my second sponsor for this conference, and that's Casanova College. Um, I'm going to read something out, and you can see the logo here. Casanova College, located in upstate New York, USA, offers a dual major in psychology and criminal justice and homeland security studies to motivated students looking for a competitive degree. Students of this dual program will learn about applied disciplines such as investigative psychology. Investigative psychology um, tends to be more actively engaged in supporting the various aspects of the investigative cycle and draws upon an inductive methodological approach to eight active in investigations. An operational application of investigative psychology would be the development and utilization of a geographical profile, for example, to aid in the identification of where an unknown offender of an unsolved crime series is likely to be based. In short, this enhanced curriculum has been developed for students interested in learning about criminal behaviors, careers in law enforcement, as well as preparation for careers and or graduate studies in forensic or investigative psychology, forensic mental health counseling, or law school. So um, you've see you've got the link to Casanova University the College there, and that you'll um, you'll major. Um, copy that onto your list of links for later, and just have a look and check them out. And I'm very grateful for the sponsorship of this conference. We've got two more sessions to go. That doesn't mean that any less valuable than the others. Um, I just have nine sessions to take you through today. Um, so the next one is by Dave Nishaw. Dave Nishaw trains practitioners in the mental health and addiction field. He is a trainer, coach, therapist, hypnotherapist, and the director of Better Minds. He works on helping people feel better and make better decisions every day. He will talk to us about how, as the first on scene, you as a police officer, for example, as the first responder to someone in crisis, and let's face it, many of the people you encounter as a police officer are in crisis, um, what you can do how you can do your best until the person is referred to a specialist, perhaps, or until the crisis is over. So what can you do? Hi, my name is Dave Nishu, and we're going to look at today how persuasion science can inform first role in responder interventions. And all being well, for years, those uh, events will reduce the intensity, duration and frequency of those incidents. And uh, today we're going to have a look at some of the principles, uh, a working example, and how to apply it into your own. Persuasion science affects and impacts every dialogue that we do. And where we can use it most is at the lowest intensity interventions uh, because we've got more flexibility. So um, I've used it and continue to use it with runaways, with addiction, and public order offences. And what we're trying to do is just minimise the intensity of those interventions and also make it so that people get the help they need and we move them forwards. We're going to look at the principles of persuasion science. Um, going back to 1984, these originated uh, with Robert Cialdini, who wrote a book called Influence and gathered up uh, what he thought was the core principles. And the first thing to get people to do what you want, you've got to get them to like you. In modern parlance, we use the word rapport, building good rapport. And in order to build a good rapport, first of all, you need to compliment people. Pleased to see you, give them a smile, build a connection, find something you've got in common, the same name, you've both got dogs, uh, you've both got a history of living in a particular area. Um, and on top of which, match and mirror, move as they move, use at their pace slow things down if they're too animated, and eventually use something called tactical empathy. And tactical empathy comes from the FBI uh, and their core negotiations with hostage negotiations. And as you chat to somebody and report, report back to them what you've heard, report back so that they say, that's right. And at the point that they say, that's right, it indicates that they're now persuadable. They're now amenable to making changes. 
reciprocity is the process of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And as part of that process, offer them a compliment and we, we just feel the need to compliment back. Offer some practical help and advice. Something very simple. Maybe you want to do it like this. Maybe it'll be quicker if you do it like that. And once you've done that, you can ask for a return on that by saying, now help me to help you. And the final thing you can do in reciprocity is be vulnerable. If people are anxious, share with them that you've been anxious before. If they're frightened, if they're angry, say that actually we all get. And you know, these times when I got angry, and once you become vulnerable, it gives them permission to really, really calm down and invest in you. Equally, when people are very, very fraught and the situation is fraught, normalising it, and in this context we call it social proof, saying actually lots of people get in the, the position that you have, lots of people struggle with things that you have. We'll bring things forward and people become more persuadable. Consistency. What we say, what we feel and what we think all gel together to a form of consistency. We like to be consistent with what we think, what we say, and what we feel. And as a consequence, we can use this. If we, as we compliment somebody at the beginning of this process to build a rapport, tell people that they are great people, that they're intelligent people, that they're sensible, they're amenable. This process is called labeling. And now we can say, to do with consistency, well, actually intelligent people would buy this solution, wouldn't they? and people will invest in you and move forwards. Another mechanism in terms of consistency is the Ben Franklin effect. A former president from the 1780s noticed that he couldn't get people to do what he wanted. So what he did instead was he asked them for a favor, a tiny, tiny gift. And this is quite counterintuitive. If you get somebody to do something for you, cognitively, they reason that I must like them because I've done something nice for them. And so in sales, people will use it. So they will say, oh, can you just leave the door on the latch when I pop back to my car? And if I'm going to do that, I must trust them. If I help somebody, I must invest and like them. Um, in the case of Ben Franklin, he, lent somebody, uh, he asked me to lend him a book. And forevermore, that person became an ally rather than somebody who was hostile to him. And then the final consistency technique that I share with you is the foot in the door technique. If you can't get somebody to do the big thing to calm down and stop and end a, a conflict situation, ask them to do a little thing. If people want access to the help that involves going to rehab, perhaps suggesting at least come with me to the building, I can show you around. And so if we want to get people off the streets, want people to manage their addictions, want people to stop running away, if we start using these tools, we'll find that they respond much more quickly. And then once people are ready, we can use the tool called scarcity, which is now you're in a great place. Let's action this now. Let's go to that appointment now. Let's get you that phone call now. Let's get the people who can support you in right now. Because you never know tomorrow, you might not be in the right place. And using these tools means that we can move people's forwards. Now, in order to move people forwards, we need to stop that destructive behavior. And the first we use is stop so that people actually stop making things worse. And also so they don't repeat that behavior and start applying themselves to a new, more, much more productive behavior. We can look at these two tools. In reality, we don't like loss more than we do like gain. So if we tell people what they're gonna gain, it's useful, but it's nowhere near as powerful as if we tell them if you don't do it, what you're gonna lose. So if people don't sort their stuff out, telling them that actually sort your stuff out you'll get your kids back. Uh, stop using substances and you know you'll have money in the bank. Better to tell them exactly the same data but via, via a uh, viewpoint of loss. So what we would say instead is, if you don't sort yourself out in a year from now, what, ha, what would you have lost out on? You would have lost out on not seeing your kids. Uh, what wouldn't you have in the bank if you don't sort your stuff out? You wouldn't have that. Uh, the other form of loss is loss of autonomy. Loss of a sense of control incredibly powerful and the way we would say it is just use choice just use choice what would you prefer sleep in your own room or sharing with a stranger eat what you like or being forced to have what's given to you on a plate and just that loss of control 
plus loss of aversion makes people much more predisposed to stopping the behavior that you want to so that you don't get that repeat and repeat and repeat incident. Equally, there are strategies to promote good behaviors, to make people move in the direction that you want. And it's the way that you deliver them. We know what's right for people. So before you tell them anything, ask for permission to tell them, is it all right if? And it's an incredibly powerful block of information. If you've been looking enough to train in MI, motivational interviewing, you'll find most of the tools that come from here come from uh, are present in front of you right now. So seek permission. Is it all right if I tell you? Have you heard of? Again, use choice, but this time use choice which guides them in the direction you want. Would you like me to make a phone call now or do you want me to do it in 10 minutes? Do you want to put that weapon down or do you want me to take it from you? Use reason. This is a phenomenally banal but effective tool. Um, you can get about 90% compliance just by use of the word, re, uh, by use, use of reason. And because you are here right now, you're going to move forwards. Because we are here right now, we can sort this out, okay? And so use of reason, the word because, strangely magnifies the impact that you can have even if the reason is ludicrous. And soften your commands. It's just say, I want you to do this. Say, whilst I sort this out, you can sit down and stay calm. Whilst you come over here, we can get this sorted. And then finally, when people are where you want to be, you want to access the support that's needed for them. Whenever you refer somebody on, compliment the service. They're amazing. They'll really look after you. Explain the value to the person rather than the value of the service. For you, they're going to be incredible. They're going to help you with X. Mention a story of when it's worked before. Again, that social proof we talked about. Encourage them to talk through the whole journey of attending. So what are you going to do when you've left here? How are you going to get there? And as they talk it through, they will create neural pathways and be more and more okay with the idea that they're doing it. And finally, Ask them to explain and scale out of 100 how likely they are to attend. If they say how likely they are to attend, they're typically going to say a high number. And because of consistency, now they've said a very high number, it's 95% certain I'm going to attend after this session, Dave. At that point, they're much more likely to attend. The data says a third. If you use these tools and a combination of all these tools, you can double the outcomes. You can half the pain of the service. You can make it twice as likely that people get the access they need. When we look at something like running away, young people who run away, if they do it once, they're twice as likely to do it again than uh, a typical member of the public. I worked with a person who ran away 21 out of 22 days prior to me working with him. Once I started working with him, he only ran away one more time. And yet in the last 22 days, he'd run away 21 of them. Uh, and that young person was in the looked after system. And it was a combination of all these tools. It's just getting the mix right. But it doesn't always mean that people want to listen to your persuasion, your advice. Uh, so some people will reject good advice. And we'll have a quick look at that. And then uh, you use whatever tools are best for you. So uh, people will reject A, because it's the wrong thing or it's at the wrong time. Uh, if it's the wrong thing, you've not been listening. If it's the wrong time, just step back and build rapport again. However, the other things that you can do in terms of pushing people forwards, just keep repeating your message. Use reinforcing questions. So why do I want you to go there? Because it's good for me. Um, and use yes sets. Get them to say yes a lot and nod their head when they're saying the right thing. I hope you found this useful. It's a very quick journey through 140, 150 different persuasion tools. They're all out there. They're all accessible if you want to look them up. Equally, if you want to access any more information on this, uh, come back to me. I'm Dave Nisha. Uh, thank you for your time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the work that's in front of you. Okay, thank you, Dave Nisha, for this. Um, I actually do have the book that um, he mentioned here, The Psychology of Influence. Uh, Robert Cialdini, I guess, is the pronunciation. Um, it's a very, very famous book. Um, so my my summary, my key learning points 
of this. Minimize the intensity of situations, build rapport, reflect back what you've heard them say, so active listening, share that you've been in a similar situation yourself, normalize the situation, get them to do something small for you so they can feel they trust you, or so that something inside them says, well, I've done something small for them. You know, that must mean that I, I trust them. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done that. So he was given the example. OK, so you, maybe you don't want to access these rehab services yes, yet, but let's just go inside. I'll show you the building. You know, so you, you just get over that first hurdle. Um, if you can't get someone to do a big thing, get them to do a little thing, more powerful to show what they're going to lose rather than what they could gain. So we are more afraid of losses that motivates us more. You know, a potential loss motivates us a lot more than a potential gain. And um, ask permission before giving advice, give them a choice. Use the word because. So there's some very strong research to say that if you say because, it will make the person more likely to um, comply. Get them to talk through the steps they will take after your conversation. So they start visualizing, okay, I'm going to go um, into this, into the, into that office. I'm going to go to the desk, introduce myself, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to wait for my council appointment and all of that. Get them to rate the likelihood of doing it. So get the commitment from them. You know, how likely you're going to do this and get them to state what you want them why you want them to do something. So why did I want you to attend this appointment? Because I need to speak about X, Y, Z. Okay, so to view Dave's website, visit betterminds.org.uk. Um, so put that onto your list of useful links for later. And let's get to the um, last session. Last but not least, it's the very, very amazing Nick Roy. So Nick Roy is an analyst at the US Police Department. He started the Neuro Knowledge podcast, combining crime analysis and EBP, evidence-based policing. The podcast has thrived since he started it last year. And Nick also provided training on, provides training online for crime analysts and how to use open source analysis tools. He's been on my show. I've been on his podcast. He's a very nice guy. Um, and I'm going to play you Nick's session now. Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining me here today. Uh, my name is Nicholas Roy. I am a crime analyst in the United States. I am also the host of the podcast Nero Knowledge, and I run uh, my business uh, Nero Crime Analysis here in the United States. It's a uh, online program for training videos for law enforcement analytic tools. Um, and so since I only have 10 minutes here, I'm going to just kind of jump right into this, but it has been Fantastic to listen to everybody so far, all these great presentations that um, the police science doctor has put together for us in her rapid fire conference. So let's jump right into what I'm here to talk about, which is crime analysis. And so to get into that a little bit, what is crime analysis? And I, I think one of the best uh, ways that it has been put is by the police science doctor herself. And, and when she says in her video, in its simplest form, Crime analysis is making sense of information about crime. And what she brings up is the single offense, series of offenses, and what I added in there too was really where all of this data kind of comes from, and it's generated through our call for service data, incident data, traffic offense, and collision data, and so many other different resources that analysts pull from to really kind of get a better picture of what's going on at that point as opposed to that single focus. While uh, analyzing a single offense itself, we really kind of get into uh, nitpicking around with the people, the place, um, maybe even the pattern that might be happening at that point, which then jumps into the series of offenses. Um, so we can really kind of forecast, we can take a series and realize at that point um, that maybe we have something even bigger going on. So what we have to ask ourselves is why use crime analysis? And as you can see here, nice little word cloud, <clears throat> excuse me, there are a lot of reasons to use crime analysis in here. We can do uh, some research and see what maybe some strategic uh, implementations have done, whether they've done well and succeeded. Uh, maybe they haven't. What can we do to readjust it and go from there? But along with it, we can assist in a lot of investigations. Um, with that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we can maybe look at a pattern that is starting to emerge, maybe populate where 
where and when the next location might be, maybe where a suspect might reside or hit next, um, along with you know an area of uh, where potential suspects may reside um, or their base of operation in a sense as well. So there's a lot of behavioral nuances that can come out of that as well. Um, we can track events at that point and, and you know really kind of bring to fruition maybe there's a danger in a, a concert or some gathering that's about to happen um, but there's a lot of different capabilities that an analyst can use leveraging all those different data sources that come into play and giving again that greater picture of what's going on so one of the things uh, to kind of put it a little more specific one of the aspects is top offenders uh, as you know some of the higher ranking officials might be aware of as well as research and definitely you know some of the patrol units everybody within the spectrum of policing understand usually it's a small group of people that eat up a lot of the resources at that point so to know our top offenders would be a great way to strategize what's the what, what can we do with them in order to assist them to kind of get them back on a better path at that point if they want to be right um, one of the ways is leveraging problem-oriented policing and understanding some of the behaviors of people that we're going to have to deal with, including um, some more specific popula uh, populations like mental health uh, issues that are there, substance abuse issues and domestic violence issues, especially, which just in tune with um, some of the conversations that you have seen here already, where we could probably take a look at what's going on with uh, a family, a couple, and their domestic violence problem, it may be the level of frequency in which we are interacting with them. At that point, either getting the uh, problem-oriented police officer, the unit involved, and uh, getting that assistance out to them, seeing what's really going on, and kind of getting to the heart of that behavior and the problem, and hopefully stemming any future harm to or from themselves and the people and the family and the community in which they live. <clears throat> Another one of the aspects is uh, crime linkage. So we can, you know, assist in being a little more efficient in the process of crime linkage because we can take all of those coded records, the, the incidents, the calls for service that have happened, and really kind of pool those together and start taking a look at um, what it is that is embedded in there. And it's a lot faster than leafing through every little. Uh, call for service at that point, especially if the analyst and as the analyst makes notes to the things that come across their desk, right? So let's say if you have an armed robbery series that's going on, um, the coding system within your record system is really going to allow the analyst to start piecing together uh, the patterns that might be there. Um, is it a certain weapon? Is it a certain suspect that comes in? And at that point, um, with those descriptions, that are keyed into the coding system, as well as, again, looking maybe into the narrative and coding it out for ourselves, um, we can go through and start kind of taking a look at what there is and mapping the stuff together, right? So we can connect the traits to continue um, finding uh, the, those, those nuances within it and, and really attributing things to the suspect. And with that, as we go in, we know that people really tend to have the same habits, right? As, as people, we all have our routines and the things that we like. So to leverage that, we can now go into something like geographic profiling and take this crime linkage idea and continue it over. And with that crime series, um, we can take this, uh, like a map of all of the crimes that have taken place and where it is in those nuances and go, all right, so this is the spot that I'm working in. Now what's next? And with it, we can go uh, assist investigators to come up with potential suspects because maybe somebody was either just released from prison. Maybe we know somebody who's in the area that was, um, you know, kind of fit this MO and they haven't done it in a while. So here is what's going on. It kind of fits what they have done before. This is where they live within this uh, you know, network of, of patterned crimes that are happening. Um, so with that, we can map not only the similar crimes at their locations, but now we can po potentially put a suspect within that area as well, uh, as long again as that 
has been captured previously. So we can keep in mind the, the times of the crimes and kind of get an idea of, of where it is, what's happening, and really kind of paint this picture and uh, put it all together for you. Um, <clears throat> as we know, the crimes that tend to happen near a certain location of operation for either the potential suspect um, it is great uh, as well for the, the value of what it is. Maybe it's not ne necessarily their, their residence, but an old hangout spot, right? A couple of blocks away, maybe. So that's where, uh, in a sense, their base of operation is. And so you just kind of follow this behavioral pattern that people tend to have, and they don't tend to stray far um, from it. And so we can really leverage geography at that point in time, along with uh, again, that crime linkage of seeing the patterns of the crimes that are going on, the MO, and that behavioral aspect can really um, come to fruition for what people have, um, have done and what we can potentially see them continuing to do, unfortunately, and how we can now uh, apprehend and intervene effectively down the road. So as I come to an end of this whole uh, presentation, I really appreciate everybody joining in and staying tuned. And thank you very much to Dr. Suzanne Kanabi Nicole for the police science doctor herself for inviting me here. Um, I do have some information for you folks. Again, if you were not aware, um, I do host a podcast. It is a bridge between evidence-based policing and academia, as well as analysts trying to forge that uh, connection between the people who do the research and some of the practitioners or the people I believe that are, are um, effective in, in helping shape the culture of policing in some form by being uh, evidence and data driven. My website is on there as well. Neuro Crime Analysis for the online training of free and open source programs is the, uh, the lookout that I do for uh, law enforcement analysts, my email. And if you wish to uh, have part of a global conversation, join up that Slack group and, uh, you know, speak to all of us about what you do and what you use to uh, make this community and the greater community abroad uh, that much more uh, effective and making sure that we can reduce crime and leverage evidence-based policing. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Nick. I made him practice my surname before he was allowed to say it out in public and he did very well. Um, so my notes from this talk, analysts can make crime data visible and they can make sense of it without them, with, I think without analysts, police would be lost. Um, they can identify top offenders and see how their funding can be reduced because of where to focus, like we were saying earlier with the hotspots patrols, identifying patterns in call data and crime series, linking crimes using the codes that are in the data systems or linking them manually by reading through inputs carefully. Um, so the, we're going to post the, the links to Nick's podcast, Neuro Knowledge, and to Nick's website, neuroca.com, in there. And um, it's worth checking out. And he does have an amazing podcast. Now, there was the last session. So, I, I guys, I'm so sorry. This whole thing took... Um, almost three hours. It was my first one. And um, I can't believe so many of you are still here. I really, really appreciate it. It means so much to me that you're finding this so useful. Um, I'm, I want to do another rapid fire conference later in the year, sometimes in the autumn, but I'm not going to have nine speakers. I'm probably going to have something I can keep to between one and a half hours and one to one and a half hours. So there's going to be fewer speakers. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, again, if you want to have all the sessions together in a format that you can take with you, the ebook, we've got the link here. Um, register for the conference if you want to get, um, you can still do that. It's probably going to take me, uh, you know, one, two, three days, I don't know, to do the certificates. So you can still register for the conference and get a certificate of attendance if you want that. As a subscriber, you get the um, the ebook at a discount of $2. Um, so it's $11.99 or $9.99. It's not uh, it's, it's not expensive and it's got everything that was uh, that was said today and the links and resources and everything. Um, so Ginny's emergency stress pit stop course, just for you to copy onto your notes to check out for later, um, is policesciencedoctor.com GM1, Ginny McKenna 1. So that's the course that's coming out in May that we're doing together, emergency stress pit stop. Then we've got the free global mental health in policing webinar coming up. That's in three weeks from today. So go to the um, to the website that we've got linked in here and register for that. It's a free webinar. 
And, um, you know, even somebody's touched one of the com comments on there was, was about mental health and how you get no support. So you, you're going to be wanted that to be at that webinar. And the Police Science Doctor Academy is just academy.policeSciencedoctor.com. There's going to be um, lots of more courses in the future. Some of them actually from the speakers you've heard today. And um, thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed it. I would find it quite useful if you could tell me in the comments um, what what format of presentation you found the most useful. So we had speakers who were just this just a speaker on the screen on the screen, no presentation. We've had one with just a presentation. We've had some with presentation and the speaker in in a little format. What works best for you? I'm always researching learning formats so I can make sure that um, you can absorb the information the best way. I mean, the reason why I did this conference in the first place was because um, many conferences, the talks get boring. They're so long and they're boring. And then, you know, if somebody asked me, okay, what was this hour about? I, sometimes I wouldn't be able to tell them. So what I do, I try to combat all of that. I have short, sharp sessions of training and I pull out the key learning points for you and I tell them, I feed them back to you just in case you miss them. So for, I would love it if somebody did that for me for something I want to learn, something very succinct, very relevant, and somebody actually packaged it all. Okay, see, these are the key learning points that you need to walk away with. So I hope I was able to do that for you usefully in a way that you were able to absorb. Um, I really appreciate you. Um, thank you very much. And I'll see you maybe at the Mental Health and Policing webinar. I'll see you during my lives about the police science snippets. And um, yeah, you guys are amazing. And, you know, carry on. Bye bye. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this content useful. You can get access to each episode's transcript with key learning points, timestamps, and references if you get yourself onto my mailing list. Just go to the main website on policesciencedoctor.com, and on the bottom of each page, you will find a sign up form for notifications of new content. Just enter your first name, your preferred email address, and the type of organization you work for. You will not get any spam. This is just for me to let you know about new content and for you to get access to all the transcripts.